All right, what's going on, everybody? Uh, this is Kali Glover, all, along with all my other fellow musicians, engineers, and just extra talented folks. This week, we're getting started again on our Hangout. And um, yeah, today, what we're going to talk about kind of is something I've been doing a lot of, you know, I'll, I'm always doing research to see what new things uh, I might want to learn or refresh my memory on to keep up on. And then I started thinking, you know what, we might as well talk about it in an open forum because I know a lot of people, you know, are always looking for what's the next thing. You know, you don't just stop learning as far as, you know, you learn a couple of engineering techniques or you learn a couple of production techniques and it doesn't stop there. You know, you just go in the lab and do it and then you're done. No, you need to um, just keep finding new things, people are going to turn you on. You guys know that uh, we got uh, Bill Kamek, he's he's here and Bill's like a wealth of turning people on to all kinds of stuff that he discovers out there, you know. And then the, the uh, thing about Bill too is he's an implementer, so he will try the different things, you know, the different ideas that people present and, and different pieces of software to see what it does. So it gives you options. So today I want to discuss more about some of the um, options. First of all, little things like, is it necessary um, to know something like music and really kind of know it? You know, now, I'm not saying you have to get a, you know, a master's degree in it or anything like that, but I know the moment that I made the decision to actually learn at least the basics of music, it took me way past where I was when I started. And I started at a decent place because although I played by ear, I had a very, uh, well, still, I have a very good ear that was just a natural God-given talent to hear music and figure things out by my ear. And so um, when I was playing guitar regularly in the bands and everything, that was my strength. I could not read music at all, but I could hear something and be right in there as it's playing. I have it figured out, you know, unless it was something super complicated, way beyond my, you know, um, knowledge, you know, like certain jazz things and all that. But, you know, most music is pretty much the same. So the, what, the moment that I decided, let me learn the foundation of music. And, okay, I can hear this stuff, but why can I hear it? I know the move to this chord because uh, I'm anticipating it, but why do I know that? You know, why is my ear leading that? And then I started finding out that there are natural things that um, happen all the time. You know, so little things like... Um, learning the concept I'd always heard of, like the cycle of fourths and the cycle of fifths, you know. Heard that as a term, but it never really meant anything to me because, you know, me playing as a musician, I just did it by my ear. But then I started realizing that all the stuff that I was doing naturally, it followed that cycle, you know. And so once I said, okay, I tried to learn it a couple of times and it got um, very... You know, I, I'm impatient, so it got very uncomfortable for me to just sit down and make myself go through all 12 keys going through the cycle. But I had to make a decision at some point that if you really want to get better and know what you're doing, you have to practice this, and, and um, it'll take you and, and reveal a lot of other things. So I started doing that, and then I uh, realized, oh, okay, I kind of hear that. And then when I started listening to music, I could actually hear what was doing it, and even where it was. The revelation for me, what elevated me was suddenly when I didn't have the ability to hear how jazz was moving through things. When I learned that one little thing, suddenly I could hear some stuff in jazz that I'd never heard before. You know, now there was a lot more to it, so I started realizing that things were built on that. And um, said, okay, let me add a little bit more. I learned that, you know, start, you know, then you start building the skills, you start building intervals. You know, as a guitar player, for example, I learned that. Um, you know, as most probably people that learn how to play guitar, here's how it usually goes for most people. Most people usually learn, you know, the basic things. They have a thing called the cage system on guitar because the guitar, the way it's tuned, all the chords in the open string spell out the word cage because uh, the root chords are C, A, G, E, and D as far as the open chords you can play down there. So then you build everything up off of that. So I learned just like everybody else, starting out with those basic open chords, and then you start learning your first uh, what's called bar chords. Those of you that aren't guitar players, I'm just kind of glossing over, over it, but those of you that are guitar players, you know exactly what I'm talking about. You learn your first few bar chords, you struggle to get your muscles to hold them down and everything, and then you play them up and down the neck. And once you start going up and down on the neck, you know, it's pretty much the same. Guitar is a shape-based instrument, you know, but music is also shape 
and pattern based. You know, you know, you can play um, music and you can play like even for example the way um, the hip hop started evolving from um, samplers and things like that. You know, that's because you got a shape of something that got captured as a sample. You know, it was like a progression, a chord, something, and then you started finding out, but if I play it on different pads, I can make music. You know, well, that's really just taking that static shape and moving it around. So that's kind of how the guitar works as well, too. Once you learn basic shapes, you move them around and everything. But the key is to connect it together musically that may open the world for me. Once I got past my normal um, natural ability and my natural ear ability, knowing why the music was moving, you know, how it naturally moves through that cycle, you know, knowing how intervals naturally move to each other, how chords stack and everything. Those kind of things really took me to a whole nother level as far as understanding and hearing the music up in my head first, you know, hearing what I wanted to make up here and having a clear idea of where it wanted to, where it could go or where I wanted it to go rather than just kind of stumbling on some stuff and saying, okay, that sounds good. Okay, I like that. No, I don't like that but not knowing why I don't like it. So anyway, to make a long story short on this, I thought it'd be kind of interesting. The other aspect of it was, and um, you know, I think Dave will probably be able to address a few of these things like this, because he and I have also, in our journeys, have had to learn little aspects of business side, you know, because being an engineer, you know, and being a musician, I didn't really have to worry about the music business per se, other than, you know, just as a musician, you know, you do your gig and then you get paid. Whoever whoever hired you, they give the whoever's the manager or the band leader or whatever their money. Everybody gets it doled out. That was my business. That was all I needed to know. I got my money at the end of the gig. Um, as an engineer, it kind of worked the same way. Basically, I worked in the studio and, um, you know, at, when I was on staff at Lion's Share, you know, I got my paycheck. So there wasn't no real business other than me knowing that I had to fill out my W-2 form and then I look out for my, you know, weekly check. And um, as you, I went independent, then suddenly it's like, okay, now you got to get into other things. You know, you got to know what the different forms are. You know, you got to fill out your, um, you know, your 1099s and I-9s and, and all these little things. It's like, whoa, what the heck is all this? Then the tax time comes up suddenly. You're in a whole different thing. You know, you got to fill out Schedule Cs and you got to go through all this, knowing that. And then that's just for handling the government for the income that you got, it's still a passive kind of thing. What if somebody, you know, if you're a musician, you know, me, I still have my musician thing, so I was able to get some of my songs published and things like that. Suddenly I had to come up and start a publishing company, you know. Suddenly I had to do uh, a lot of things, you know, figure out what the heck is a Harry Fox agency to get, you know, my royalties that I want that as an option or another option. So many different things. Now my conversation is today is, is um, does other people think it's necessary and helpful, or can, can you get along and have a whole full career without any of it? You know, so I think it'll be an interesting discussion to talk about. So um, anyway, with that being said, what's up, guys, and what do y'all think about it? Just everybody kind of tell me, you know, what you might think about that subject matter and business-wise, music-wise, foundation-wise. You know, uh, let's, let's chime in on it. Anybody, y'all can unmute. Anybody want to talk? Gavin, I know you got your guitar right there, so you're about to go through the musician thing like I've talked about. You know, do you deal with things like dealing with the cycle of force and fists to practice guitar and learn more about movement and stuff like that? Are you there, bro? And I'm hoping that I didn't lose audio on everybody because I can't hear you. Can everybody hear Gavin? Uh-oh. I may have a problem here. Let me see if it's me, because I'm not hearing anybody. I was doing all that talking. Oh, yeah. Can you hear me? Yeah. Uh, okay, I'm back now. Yeah, I hear you now. You hear, you hear me, guy? Yeah, yeah, I got you. Yeah. All right, good, man. Okay, I you know, hear you. The answer to that, to that question is you don't have to know any of that stuff, and you can have a great career. It's I think what when you're gonna really have a problem is when you get to a point when you can't keep up with that, you know, five shows a week or, uh, you know, at, when you get to be my age, you know, a little, uh, you know, I'm not old yet, but I'm, I'm getting there, you know, and, uh, you know, when you hit 60, 70 years old, what's going to happen? If, mm -hmm. if you don't know any of that stuff, you're not going to learn, you're not going to be able to protect yourself um, for, you know, later in life, I think. Yeah. 
Exactly. Yeah. And plus, you don't set up a foundation if you don't set up a foundation for yourself. That's a good point. Um, later on, you know, like I mean, I, I, when I think about it, you know, I, like I said, I got through just fine for many years, and I got to L.A., got on some gigs, and, and got with some, you know, big people that knew it at another level, but they recognized that I had something, I guess, special that. He's like, okay, this guy's kind of funky, you know, he, he fits in. But the problem that I started recognizing in myself, and part of what made me kind of give up on the guitar was that I realized was that, okay, I've got my thing. Dave calls it a shtick. <laughs> you know, when you do your shtick, we work with many artists that they have their little shtick that they do. It's just their thing. But if you have to go outside of that and be flexible outside of just that little thing that you're good at and you know, suddenly you get left in the dust and lost. And here in L.A., there's really, I mean, the, the cream of the crop can do anything. They can do your thing and then get called and go across the, uh, the um, city and do somebody else's thing with no problem where you're stuck in your one little thing. And that's what I realized that I... You know, I had to recognize those were my limitations. And if I was going to be a guitar player, I had to go to that other level and do it. Or if I was going to be an engineer, be flexible enough to capture it. You know, so I chose the latter route. Right. You know. I think there's a lot of engineers that um, cross that same bridge. I would yeah. say that I'm one of them as well. Yeah. yeah. I knew that, you know, my, my talent only took me so far. And then it was going to have to be really get myself into uh, learning the ins and outs of music, um, sight yeah. reading music, and, and just in the ear training, the whole nine yards, and because yeah. uh, I couldn't keep up with some of the guys, you know, I would get into, uh, uh, with some of the session players, and I, there was just, I couldn't compare myself to them, I yeah. just couldn't. They were just so much better than me, and not that their fingers were faster or that they had better ears, but they knew and understood all the parts and how they went together, all those shapes and how they intertwined on a guitar. Yeah, yeah. And they just knew it, and they talk about stuff that went right over my head because I I didn't even know the vernacular. Yeah, yeah, exactly. And yeah. then they can they can move, you know, they can be mobile in um. You know, like if a song needs to have something that says, "Well, you know what? That's cool. It's kind of close, but I needed to have, needed to, needed to feel a little more green." It was like, huh? What the hell? But these guys could go in and find what that meant. What does when somebody says, "You know, you get in the stu in the studio," and and it really was an education for me to watch like Quincy Jones, like I said, because he talks in colors. He's always admitted it, and everybody knows those stories. Mm -hmm. But um, he talks in colors, and the best guys he calls in can figure out, though, yeah, I know what you mean. Jazz guys do that. They really have, you know, ways that they talk that are very, very different. And i got to ask you guys, too. You guys are watching me. Is my video, like, kind of slow motion and jerking? Because it is on my side. Something's going yeah. on my connection. Yeah. Oh, okay. Okay. Uh, all right, I might have to sort that one out. It was fine a while ago. It was normal when you first came in, right, Dave? Yeah, it was. Yeah. I think the more more people got online, the more it started to bog down. Yeah, but that that should I mean uh, we've been doing these hangouts, and that doesn't usually happen. Uh, I, like I said, my my computer is dying, y'all. I'm dreading it. I have to <laughs> get a new one, you know, and reconfigure it. You know the pain that is. I've been putting it off as long as I can. Yeah, we're hearing some audio from somebody. I think uh, who's that? Gavin? No, Gavin's muted. We're hearing playback from somebody over a speaker. So mute yourself, guys, unless you're ready to talk. Well, anyway, let's get back to the subject, Dave. Dave, like I mentioned for you too, you know, I was mm -hmm. talking about my musician side, but you know, also we had to get in and learn about, um, you know, certain business aspects. You know, so um, yeah. 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 Uh, you know, I think I think uh, we we all adapt our skill set in. Uh, and Dave, do me a favor, pull your camera down because we're just getting the top of your okay. head right now. Oh, sorry about that. Is that better? Is that better? Yeah, that's better. Yeah. Okay. That's better yeah, we all ad adapt our skill set. You know, we we constantly, constantly uh, are in situations where we'll pick up business things from all kinds of places as we keep going and working with different people, especially working now with a lot of video people and a lot of these animated things and some of these other larger 
uh, pro projects at, at times that when it comes down to the work when you're doing it, it's still just a core group of people. And so you start to uh, kind of pick up some things and add it to your basket, so to speak, of what you know about the business and how you need to educate yourself. Um, we've seen it change over, over a long period of time because we're so involved in a process originally of making hard goods that now when we're involved in a process of making digital goods, it switched over. So some of the language is starting to change about how to kind of make sure that we as technical people get our end of it straight and then get whatever we're, we're entitled to in, in situations where those doors open up, you know. I just think it's it's one of those things you 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 inevitably have to take on several hats when you're an independent, be it an engineer, producer, or whatever, because you're going to have to be your own publicity department at a certain point. You're going to have to be your your own secretary at a certain point. You know you're going to have to keep track of a lot of different things. The music you will find at times is a small part of it, because yeah. the thing that keeps you in the ability to create musical situations if you're a producer is the fact that you understand the business and how to keep the business generating, how to keep the business flourishing, how to increase if you've been producing. I know when we started we had some producer friends and they would say, you know, I got this down. You know, I only, I will only really have to work on three albums a year for me to have a good year, right? Uh -huh. Now say that phrase now and somebody would think you're crazy. First of all, to be able to get three albums a year is is, is unheard of. Yeah, yeah, and the competition that's out there and the cutthroat things that happen just to get a song on a album are ridiculous. So it's it's changed that fast with a introduction and all this the digital stuff. You know, on the engineering side, I think it's also how people choose to work and how they choose to spend their time, knowing kind of what you do real well. You know, I was mentioning to Kalik that I, I happen to have a lunch conversation with a young man named Terrence Martin. He's a producer of Kendrick Lamar. And I was asking him, and I said, hey, you know, I bet you probably got a lot of of systems or a lot of, you know, you probably got a portable rig and you're doing it. He's like, no, man, I'm not the portable guy. Yeah, he and, and now he's got to realize this is a young producer, you know. He said, no, I'm not the portable guy. He said, there's a lot of people that do that. He said, man... I kind of train myself to work on any anywhere on any DAW. I'll mix on anything. So, consequently, when we do these songs, if we're on the road, and somebody doesn't have a plugin that I use, I don't trip. I just use what they have. I'll use stock plugins, and I thought that was a very creative way. Until we started talking more, and I found out, okay, he knows quite a bit about music. So what he what what he does is he he sits in a lane called hip hop, but as a young man who knows music, he's a reference of all this other information, which gives him the ability not to tend to rely on I've got all the plugins, I've got all the this, I've got all the that. He knows musically where a song is going and how some of these things go together. So he's constantly altering the material and changing it. And then on top of that, when he's hit with what plugins do I have to work with today? He's not doing anything but giving himself room to, to improvise as a musician. He's going straight to improvisation, but he's applying it towards another thing. I thought it was a really good mentality for creation because you never get stagnant doing that. You never get stagnant. Yeah. We, we had a, a little bit of a conversation about that uh, about a week ago, you know, and, and it, it was just good. It was refreshing to hear it from one of the younger producers, you know. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Hey, man, um... First of all, I want to ask everybody, did Dave's audio sound okay? It's, it's funny on my end, but like I said, I think that's my computer. Was it okay for everybody else? Yeah, yeah. Hey, 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 hey. Whoa, what was, what was that? Hey, Gavin. Oh, uh, okay. Y'all can hear me now? You're coming in, man. You sound okay, good. Okay. Oh, okay. No, I was trying to say earlier, whenever he was talking about the guitar and stuff and his whole journey with it, like my whole 27 years of living has just been basically a music journey. Like every decision I've made all evolved around music and like when I was young like what got me into music was in fifth grade I saw a kid play guitar and it just 
it just made me want to pick up a guitar, and he showed me how to play by showing me a few bar chords to um, Nirvana, Smell Like Teen Spirit. Then eventually I joined the orchestra, and I learned how to read, because um, I was playing bass, I learned how to read bass music, but the way I learned how to play guitar, I would sit by my CD player, and I would just jam along with my C with Eric Clapton or Jimi Hendrix or something. And I was playing at church, and I was like 9, 10, and I asked the older cats, like, what would I need to listen to to get better? And they were just like, B.B. King, this, that, and the third. And then that's just how I that's just how I learned how to play music. Just like when I got on here, I was like, I was just playing along to Isaac Hayes and Willie Hutch because that's the only way I know how to play guitar. But it's like nowadays, the, my generation, most of the people I come across that do music are all just I call them digital babies because they don't have no type of like musical background. They just grab a plug in and go to a preset and play the a. Uh, just, you know, anything with MIDI, they don't actually have any musicianship about their type of music that they make, which I kind of hate, but it is what it is. Yeah. And, um, you know, uh, that'll carry you so far, you know, there's nothing wrong with that. It's exactly how I got going and everything. It will carry you so far, but the problem is, is there's a wall. There's a wall. So once you run into the wall, you can't go any further in your career without um, adding more skills. You know, you there's plenty of people that have made a great living doing that and have even run into that wall, but they stay in their right little, do their thing, and that's it, you know. But I'm talking about if you want to go uh, a little farther um, and asking yourself, you know, like you said, um, you, you know, you, you learn to play along with some records and things like that. You play along with some of the greats and everything and learn their styles. Are you are you finding any value in adding some of the more foundational things? You know, like I said, like learning about music. Once you learn how to do some of that other stuff, because I think that's for, that's that's important. Because first of all, the music was played and heard. The music was felt. Then it was written down. That's the order. You know, so then it was written down and, and, and understood. You know, so. Um, I think you're doing it exactly the right order, and any musician that does it that way is the path I took on too. But do you find any value that once you've gotten that, going to the other side and learning, okay, why, why does it do that? And I think also it was different for me. For like I said, I played in the orchestra for a couple of years, and I played in a symphony. So oh, okay, good. So you already so, yeah, I played, I played, I played violin, viola, and then I switched to string bass. So oh, I, okay. I did the whole go to all region and do sight reading and all of that. And oh. lately, like I said, I've been making beats for like the past 13 years. And I've just been uh -huh. going to different beat battles and studying different people. And one thing I've learned doing beat battles is that the difference between most producers is they'll just sit and make a beat. They don't study like their favorite producers. They don't try to go study music theory and stuff like that. And I noticed that we're living in a digital era so most of the music we're making is a laptop and a MIDI controller. So I said, what can I do to help me be better at that? I've been taking piano lessons. So every Ooh. day I wake up, I play, I play this different scales on the there piano in a, in a, a circle cycle. of fifths. So when I play the piano in a circle of fifths, I also pick up my bass because, like I said, I'm a bass player before I am anything else. And mm -hmm. I'll play the scales in, in a circle of fifths. Then I'll pick up my guitar and play it in a circle of fifths. I may not necessarily can read guitar music, but please believe I understand like music theory, scales, and progressions and stuff like that. Cool. cool. But yeah, that side of things, it helped me transcend to different genres. Because like, even though I was in orchestra, I was also in jazz band. I was also in a punk rock band coming up. And it switched to like a reggae ska band. So I try to incorporate all that into ah. hip hop as well as where I'm from is like I'm from the Delta so it's nothing but blues like yeah, yeah. Robert Johnson Eric yeah. Clapton like all these people came to where I'm from like part of the Chitlin circuit so yeah, all I know is, yeah, I'm a blues baby so all I know is blues so it's like like I said my whole journey has been a musical journey so I try to incorporate that and study soul music like 
and you were saying like trying to get better and learn, I didn't know that you can take like the last hangout I was in, I was side talking to one of the cats that was in it, and he was telling me he was taking free online classes. It's this website called Coursera, like course and then right, yeah. R A at the end yeah, dot org. Right. And it, and it's free courses and I've been taking like musicianship, the the history of rock and roll part one and two and like yeah, it's just it's so many resources now compared to back in the day that you have no excuse on not learning. And if you like you said, if you don't know guitar and you just doing it the way we've done it, you're gonna hit that wall. Cause what got me into studying recently is I had to really sit and think and was like, I've been playing guitar since I was like 10, 11, and honestly, I have not progressed. Mm -hmm. People, people on the outside looking in, looking like, damn, he good, but it's like, no, you really don't understand. I've been playing like this since a kid, yeah. and I have not reached anywhere. So I had to double back and read, study music theory and all that type of stuff to make me better. You know, you know that yeah. that circle, that circle chart that you're playing. You know that that's that perspective, especially when you make the rounds on your keyboard, make the rounds on your bass, make the rounds on your guitar. You know, it's giving you so much perspective. And and the other thing that you mentioned, yeah, today when we do make music, some of the tools, especially when it comes to the software, and we had this complaint early on when the companies were developing. Everything that they put out was generated in relation to a keyboard, and so it was. It was one. It's one of those drawbacks of our industry that I wish more software had been developed specifically relating to the phrasing and the, and the structure of the way a guitar player thinks, the way a bass player thinks, the way other instrumentalists think, because we had this thing called a keyboard, and that was the primary means of, of triggering and what it did it kind of tended to jade all of these electronic music experiences to a keyboard perspective so even if you weren't a keyboard player you automatically felt like you were coming from a weaker position because you had to learn this in order to interface with all these new voicings so I think that the fact that you're doing that chart it gives you so much perspective because when you go to interface with things now your mind is quicker at thinking in in terms of the instrumentation, in terms of how you're looking at the notes and the structure. Yep, yep. Well, it's one of the things that Mott and I had actually touched on. Hey, everybody, by the way, how you doing? Hey, <laughs> one of the things Mott and I had touched on a couple months ago was, uh, you know, learning not just, not just, you know, sitting down at a piano or sitting down with your instrument and learning how to play it, or how to, you know, like the cycle of fifths, like he was talking about, you know, circle of fifths. It's not just learning how to play it, but understanding that you can create different sounds with it. You know, Spanish versus Egyptian versus maybe you want a Latin flavor. Maybe you want this. Maybe you want that. Mm -hmm. You know, and things like theory and, and the modes in general can give you those sounds if you really, if you study them and you understand them. You know, it's not, a lot of people look at theory as a big detriment to creativity. And I, I definitely disagree with that. Because yeah, when I hear something too. in my head, you know, when I hear something in my head, I want to be able to pick up my instrument and play it right away. You know, and yeah. the only way you can do that is to learn this stuff. I mean, I'm at the point where I can, I've studied it to the point where I can hear, you know, a major third versus a minor third or, mm -hmm. you know, whether it's a fourth or a fifth or a flat five or, or whatever. You know, your ear eventually starts to pick up on those things, and you can understand them. So as you hear the sounds in your head, you know, especially when it gets into exotic stuff like Spanish and Latin and, and uh, Egyptian, you know, even even things like, um, you know, getting into stuff like uh, the Napolitano scale and having that kind of Italian middle, Greek, you know, that whole Mediterranean kind of vibe. You know, all that stuff definitely all lends itself back to theory. You know, I mean, yeah. it's like I tell everybody, all music is based on do, re, mi, fa, so, la, ti, do. You know, everything is based on that. Everything. So whether a note is flat or sharp or this or that, it doesn't make a difference. It's all in the definition of the way you, way you, way you do it. You know, all your chords are built on the major scale and so on and so forth. So once you understand that and the intervals, I definitely think from a writing perspective and even from... You know, helping bands produce records, 
having an understanding of the theory definitely is is a benefit in a huge way you know to even to help yourself or other musicians try to convey the emotion that they want to convey with the piece that they're writing mm -hmm, yeah and, and, and um jason is it's, it's definitely an advantage i think too because um it opens up like you said the, the things the, the um exotic things many times that go on in your head a lot of people get scared i know i was very scared and i, I think um I suspect that if anybody out here feels like this, you know, when I started out playing by ear, I used to be one of the ones too. It's like, oh, I don't need to learn all these skills and learn all that music. Theory. It's going to take away my feeling. You know, that's going to be real technical, and it's going to be like, like, um, a, a, like an opera teacher trying to teach an R&B singer how to sing and all that. And this, and I had to come to the, the realization that no, that's not the case. The more that I understood the foundation, that it didn't matter what I was doing. Um, I could get it. The, for example, as a guitar player, many of you guys probably can relate to a lot of people. It's less of a problem with keyboard players, but it's a big problem with guitar players. Is many guitar players are baffled by the modes. As simple as they are, and you always hear this and everything, it took me years to understand what it was really doing because you, you know the concept of you're basically just starting on a different note from the major scale or whatever type of scale you're doing, it's a variation of it, but everything's varied off of that major scale. And, um, you know, for many years, I, you know, like, um, I, would, I would not realize the value of simply understanding that you're starting from a different note and ending on it as far as foundation, starting and ending on different notes to to lend your ear there, but the, the structure was actually the same. It wasn't this weird thing that would take you out, but it has a different sound. You know, something like, um, you know, playing the Dorian mode, you know, which is natural and everybody can hear, you know, and that let naturally lends itself into the 2-5 uh, progression versus the uh, Phrygian mode, which has that, that half step between the first note and the second note. That gives you that little exotic thing that we're talking about. And a lot of people can hear that in their mind and think that I want that sound, you know, maybe, um, you know, like I remember listening to Santana back in the day, he was, it was, it was a, a few songs where it may have been based on that mode, you know, because it had that little half-step thing, you know, starting on the minor and going half-step up to the major, and I didn't realize what it was built on, you know, very simple once you know it and everything, but it had an exotic sound, and I was like, oh, that sounds so cool. People in hip hop do that a lot now. You know, modes like the Phrygian and the, the uh, Midian and all those are very, very common now where people were avoiding them back in the day when I was first starting because they almost sounded too foreign and too exotic. It's kind of commonplace now. But when you know what it's built on, uh, you can really take it to another level. And then doing um, all the alterations from that, having that information can do nothing but keep you more in the game, nothing but enhance your creativity way more because most people were hearing that stuff in their head already. They just don't understand why they're hearing it. Do you agree, Jason? Oh, absolutely. You know, And that's, that's, that's I completely agree with all of that. And the other thing is, since the modes have their particular sounds to them, when you hear a piece of music that you, you know either you're influenced by or want to learn, it because you know the sound of that mode and the way it sounds, you know that's where it's played because it doesn't sound like the other modes. You know now all you have to find is the key center of the song, and now you know all your chords that are going to be in the song, all the scales you can use in the song. You know you can create better vocal melodies. You can find your harmonies. You know it's all simple. I mean even if you look at like Melodyne and Autotune, you know, they have exotic scale options that if you don't know this stuff, how do you use it to properly tune a vocal? You're going to go in and tune it by hand completely the whole thing from top to bottom? All right. If you program that scale, it's there. You know, I mean, the notes you want are going to be there. You know, I know so many producers that, like in Melodyne or Autotune that just use the regular, you know, they use the major scale as the basis for everything, and they kind of bounce around the key to kind of find where the song sits. Mm -hmm. It just, it, knowing this stuff just makes your job so much easier, and it just makes you more creative. Absolutely. And, uh, hey, I went, I, if y'all ever want to, like, what far as what we discuss, if y'all want to see it in action, wherever y'all live at, try to go to a producer showcase. You're going to see it. Like, watching a person that is musically inclined, like you, 
a producer showcase is two producers standing on stage and you play a snippet of your production for like a minute. And the ju- like judges be like from from like different labels and stuff, and they give you critiques. And if they like you, it becomes a networking experience. So uh-huh. you have people from all over the world. They'll be there, including me. And you will see certain producers. If you if you're musically inclined, you can tell that this person is musically inclined just by the structure of their production, versus a person that has no clue about being musically inclined. This guitar is in in the key of A, the bass is in the key of G, and they just looking at you like, like you're in the wrong. But you're looking like you need to please study music theory because I when I heard it, I thought I was committing suicide because I didn't know what was going on. I'm like, come on, man, you really gotta at least learn some type of part of it. But another thing about that, one thing I've noticed that the, the the best production I've ever heard came from musicians that actually got eventually got good at what they were doing. Like I, I went to one one uh, showcase recently, and one guy I had to go on stage and ask him what chord was that. I just want to know what chord was that. I don't even I don't even want to know your name. I don't. I'm not finna sit here and and you know praise you. I just seriously just want to know what chord progression that was so I can go home and try it. But I mean, that's all I had to say on on piggybacking off of what Jason said. Yeah. Yep. Um, can you guys hear me on any better? Oh, did I lose it? You got yeah, a bit, you got a bit of a lag, but we can hear you. Okay. Well, I'm I'm just playing with some settings. Anybody else want to comment on that? That. Um, yeah. Yeah, I've got something to piggyback on that, too, as well. And, uh, you know, and this goes right along with Jason and uh, and Gavin. When, you know, when you think of how, you know, this makes our job easier, you know, as engineers and producers. Um, when you think of, you know, for me, when I think of EQ, you know, a lot of us, most of us know, you know, that A is 440 hertz, right? We also might know that 220 is A and 110 is A and going the other direction, 880, all right? It, you know, times two, times two, you know, it just keep, it's a logarithmic progression, right? So we say, all right, well, what's middle C? It's 261 hertz, not point six, two sixty one point something, 63, I think. Exactly. Um, so when I, when I hear, when I can hear, uh, notes and after looking at frequency charts for a long enough time i started learning you know just it sunk in you know these notes are these frequencies and when i before i i grab an eq many times i already know what frequency i'm going to uh, manipulate because of the note that i'm hearing and that note equals x frequency does that make sense to you guys Absolutely. Okay. That's one of the things I have, and um, I can't even remember which training it was. One, I think it was in my, my one of my medical training courses, where um, what the heck was that? Oh, a mute yourself, never just join. <laughs> we got. <laughs> okay, let me, let me get the mute button. Okay, cool. Uh, yeah, I had it, had that in um one of my trainings too, where I give away a a note to frequency chart and say. It was a it was a huge revelation to me that um, notes are the same as what I'm doing as in, as an engineer. So if you simply know what key you're playing in, you've got a huge advantage as far as knowing how to EQ stuff. You know how to get things out. You know because it's just going to be multiplication or, or division, doubling or or um, dividing something. Or if you want to get in between for harmonics, then you know you you divide the divide or whatever to get to that to like get to the perfect fifths and stuff like that which are those um different harmonics that are in there but as far as octaves and everything you can you can know what the um fundamentals are okay let's uh let's hit the mute button again cuz somebody's putting noise in here okay uh all right uh good job so, dave nice looking chart there yeah, yeah, yeah that's, that's, that's my that's frequency that's chart. Wow, I got a, I got a big frequency, frequency chart, chart. Mm-hmm. with the hertz for the keyboard and the range of each instrument. Yeah. Gavin, are you playing back? 
over your speaker. No, that wasn't me, but it's Joseph. Figured out. Yeah, I'm hearing somebody having major feedback as they're playing it back over the speakers. If you're going to play it back over your speakers, just cut it. Hey, down I'm sorry, the guys. That was me. Oh, okay, Joseph. Thanks, okay. Mitch. Thanks, Mitch, for telling me that, Mitchell. Uh, I, uh, I had threw you the, under uh, the bus, man. He threw you under the bus. <laughs> hey, no, it really was me. That's cool. I'm glad <laughs> you told me. <laughs> it's you. <laughs> uh, no, I got it. No, that's cool. Thanks. Um, um, can you guys hear my audio any better right now? I changed. Yep. Over yeah. It's all good now. You sound great. Oh. Go ahead, Mitch. Okay, good. Well, I'll tell you. <laughs> okay. Um, um, what was I going to say? Oh, I was going to tell you guys, too. Yesterday I went to see um, – has anybody gone to see that James Brown movie, Get On Up? Loved it. I, I saw it the day it came out. Look, I hurried up and jumped when you said it. <laughs> yeah. I, man, I love that movie. What did you man, think about hey, it? hey, if you don't win an Oscar, man, something wrong. That movie yeah. – on that point. movie was off the chain. It was cast so well. I mean, and the way they that, filmed it was so oh, on point. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I mean, if you get any kind of chance to see this movie, you I think all musicians owe it to themselves to see this movie. Not to just understand that this guy, most most music styles out here were influenced by this guy in particular. You know, almost everything that's out here now, hip hop would not exist in its form the way it is out here now. He, he, he said Brown. the realest part. He said he he said if you listen to hip hop, most of my music that that's me. And when he yeah, said that, he, it hit home for me because I got like then every James Brown breakbeat you can have. Like I didn't sample from point A to point B. So when he said that, I was just like. Oh, class. Yeah, 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 exactly. You know, I mean, it's 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 so true. But the the movie clears up a lot of things about how this guy is and was um, coming up and why he influenced things so much. You know, he had one scene in the movie too. So he's just gonna, see, like we're talking today about learning music and learning about the theory of why music does and everything. But he took it to one of the most poignant and simple levels of it all too because a lot of guys you know he had Mace Hill and all these guys and they're excellent top of the top musicians and everything but the first thing he broke it all down to is you know he's like what is that he pointed at the horn you know there's a horn no nah, and, and then he pointed to somebody else and said what is that until he got one person said the right right answer the other person said it's a drum he pointed at a guitar the bass what is that it's a drum James we pointed to another what is that it's a drum He's like, it didn't matter what the notes you had and everything. You get that rhythm in there. Um, it was so funny, too. I mean, everything breaks down to the feeling of, of what it is. You get the rhythm right, because that's what changes styles. You know, the notes, we got these same notes and everything. We're talking about learning the modes, moving through all the cycles and all that. But if you learn the feel and if you learn the rhythm, which is based, you know, the rhythm is going to be based on having the feel in there. Everything will touch people, you know. This guy made a uh, made it a point to sing a cappella. I got into a big, huge ar argument with my dad when I was growing up, and then I kind of called him on it when I went to visit him a couple of weeks ago. Um, about a month ago, I went and visited him and ca called him on it because we started talking about James Brown, and then he was talk talking about he wanted to see the movies. And I was like, oh, you like James Brown now? Because when I was a kid, he, oh, that guy can't sing. You know, he just screaming. He ain't doing all this. I said, I remember when you was a, when I was a kid and you told me he couldn't sing and everything. He said, no, I didn't say that. <laughs> I, had to, I had to call him out a little bit. I threw my own dad under the bus, y'all. <laughs> but, but I had to let him know this, like, you know, it's a generational thing. James Brown was new and coming up, and everybody was used to other stuff. And um, I called him out on it because it's like me as a kid, I just felt somebody that was killing it. You know, it wasn't even about his singing. I could feel him so much. And then when the movie, they kind of showed that that's a big point that he made, that he would sing a cappella. And somebody's typing and all that. Can you meet your, meet your speakers, I'm, whoever that is? I'm, I'm trying, let me see who that is. We got all kinds of noise going on here. Let me mute. I think that's uh, I think that's Mr. Uh, J Shine. Mm -hmm. I got you muted now. Okay. Anyway, the whole point was is that um, you know, you got to feel it. He made sure when he sang a cappella, 
he would sing. He was singing in the church, singing out with the, with the fellas and everything. The foundation, and this is a lesson that I used to, um, I still do. I mean, it's part of my foundation. Somebody taught it to me. Strip away everything, because if it doesn't stand on its own, the feeling isn't there. It's got to feel right all by itself without having the adornment all around it. You know, so you should be able to sing a vocal and people still feel and imagine like there's a whole band around you. You got to be able to play your guitar. And it feel like you've got drum beats and basses and everything else going, just how you're playing. This is what I found out from, um, you know, working with studio musicians. That's why they're studio musicians, because they could all do that. When we would solo the tracks, when we're listening and everything, you didn't have to have anything else around these guys to, for their part to sound strong. It could play all by itself. The whole song, top to bottom, you know. So this is really the key to taking and elevating your music to the next level. Huge lesson. And, I mean, like I said, it just struck it that I saw it in the movie, too. That's the foundation for all the people that really became um, the icons of our music. They had a, um, a guy portraying Little Richard in there, too, and it was the same thing. It was all about that feeling and everything and um, just... You know, it's 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 a it's a really a great movie. I don't know how accurate it is or what, but it doesn't matter. It gives you a lot of insights and musical insights on where people that make these huge breakthroughs, why they made it. And it always breaks down to that this cat knew what he was trying to do and knew who he was trying to affect. And, and, they, had, to get and, it. and they also had life lessons in there too though. Big time, big time. Man, like what struck you? Mention a couple that just struck you. No, I mean, I'm not trying to tell the whole movie because I, I encourage everybody, man, look, if I could buy the movie for everybody that's chatting right now, I would because yeah. I put it I put it in that category as it, it's one of the movies you have to see before you die. Like, for me personally, like, his relationship with his mama, that's the same relationship I got with my mama. So, yeah. Deep, wow, yeah. Yeah, so, deep. yeah, that, bro, I almost got up. I cried. I ain't going to lie to you. I mean, I'm a man, so, hey. Uh, the part that I, I want to say that I'm not going to tell the whole movie, but the part that stuck out to me that hit home for real, for real, I'm going through it right now. When he asked his his friend, when the uh, you remember when the trombone asked the trombone player asked his homeboy, "Why ain't you the leader?" Yeah, just told him everybody's not meant to be the leader. Mm, yeah, yeah. When he said, "Man," when he said that, I got up. I, I was about to say, "Hey, man, we about to have offering." <laughs> it, it, when he said, "I'm gonna call my homeboy," like, did you not hear what he just said? Yeah, 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 yeah. He said, "Because of James Brown, we are where we at, and don't forget that." Yeah, yeah, yeah. That's right. That was a big one. You talking about Bobby Bird, uh, Dave? Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. And then when yeah. they show when they show Boosie at the end, I just man, I died laughing. I was just, oh my god. <laughs> yeah, yeah. I yeah, just yeah. touch on something you said earlier, Khalid, in reference to this. Um. It kind of reminds me of it reminds me of another movie that I that you know kind of older, uh, Chuck Berry's Hail Hail Rock and Roll. Hail Hail Rock and Roll, I love that. Yeah, you know, right. there's there's that scene where they're all sitting, you know, in that like rehearsal room, and Chuck keeps looking over his shoulder at at Keith Richards, and he's like, "You're not playing it right." <laughs> and 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 Keith's like, "What do you mean I'm not playing it right? You know, I'm Keith Richards. I'm I'm playing it right." And Chuck just keeps looking at him like, "No, you're not playing it right." And he just mm -hmm. drilled him and drilled him and drilled him until he got it right. And it was just, and it was literally just a feel thing, you know. Yeah, that yeah. little bit, that little bit ahead of the beat or that little bit behind the beat, just that slide and that slipperiness, you know, gives yeah. it that funk and that feel and that emotion. And it's it's such a big thing. It's one of the things, you know, like we were saying earlier, you know. If you're really not a musician, you kind of don't understand it. You know, you, you you feel it, you know, but you, you you don't really understand being able to play ahead of the beat yeah. or being able to play behind the beat. Just that little bit to give it that little bit of funk or that little bit of nastiness that it needs to convey, again, uh, emotion and feel and sound and all. It's just, it's just such a huge thing. And um, as far as the movie being truthful... I can tell you, um, it is 100% the real deal. Um, I've had the opportunity the last few years to be able to work actually with James Brown's widow, Tommy Ray, and I work with I've worked with Tommy Ray quite a bit, and we had a dis we were actually talking about the movie the other day, and wow. she said, you know, it's uh, the most unbelievable thing, 
She goes, I watched it, felt my husband was like sitting right there in the chair next to me. It felt great. It was awesome. And watch out because I'm telling you right now, James Jr., he's coming up. He's going to be a badass drummer. Look out. Yeah. Look out. Yeah. He's going to be amazing, dude. Yeah. Oh, my God. How, how can he not, though? You know, you, yeah. if he's trying to do music, how can he not, you know? Being around that, you get a whole another, a whole another understanding of perspective. Yeah. Hey, and and to piggyback off what Jason said again, like I've been, like I've been studying. Are y'all familiar with Jay Diller? Say that again. Are you familiar with Jay Diller? Jay Diller. Yeah. Name strike a bell, but I can't. He, um, if you listen, okay, if you listen to D'Angelo's Voodoo album. Jay Dilla is the reason rhythmically it sounds like that. It has that wow. off type sound. Yeah. And like he 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 really didn't get his 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 notoriety until he died. Wow. And on his uh, the tripped out story, you gotta look him up. The tripped out story is when he died on his deathbed, he was still making beats. Wow. Really? He, died, yeah. he literally died making beats. But anyways, he has this off sound. When I tell you the beat sounds so off, it 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 you looking like why does it sound so off? But yet it sounds so yeah, it's all yeah, so, yeah. So I, I I finally after like six years of trying, I finally got my drums to sound exactly like his. So I put it I put a little clip on Instagram, and yeah. all the the people that are used to rhythm, they was like, oh my god, that sounds so good. Yeah, oh, one yeah. random person came out of nowhere and said. I love the track. All you need to do is quantize the drums, and it will sound so good. Now I'm looking like <laughs> I did that. Just miss, miss the whole point. Miss the whole point. And I was in a studio with a, a older gentleman. He's got to be in his his fifties. And I played in the track, and he was just like, "Why are the beat? Why are the drums so off?" I'm like, "That don't sound good to you." He said, "No." I'm like, "Oh my god." <laughs> I'm like, I'm like, if I said, I said, look at it this way. I'm programming drums on, on Pro Tools. If I want a real drum feel, why the hell would I quantize? Why? Why? What, what would be the point of that? Like, that, that is completely, if, if I'm going, if I'm going to incorporate some live bass, live guitar, why would I want my drums to hit on time? And he was just looking at me like, I don't care what you're saying. You still need to quantize the drums. That just don't sound right. And I just had to realize that some people just naturally don't get it. Yeah, they don't get it. You know. And more importantly, um, you said that from the first thing. Is the first people that you played it for, if they felt it. There's always going to find some people that don't feel it. i got to admit, when I first heard um, D'Angelo, and I heard that off sound. You know, hey, you starting, was, hey, you starting to static real bad. I can't hear yeah. nothing. Mm -hmm. static, static again? Wow. Yeah. Okay. Um, I'll have to work on that. Okay. You guys go ahead and continue uh, continue talking, and I'm going to work on changing it. I'm going to tag on that real quick, too, with the whole off time thing. I never forget, you know, a, 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 though for yours, those of you that don't work know my background, I worked on um, I worked on some stuff back in the day when I was pretty much interning. Um, Busta Rhymes, Craig Max, sh stuff like that. A lot of a couple of the bad boy things, and um, I'll never forget the first time I walked in a room with Busta, and he started rapping, <laughs> and I'm listening to him, and I'm just going, "What is this guy doing? I don't. He's totally off time. It makes no sense." Blah blah. blah. After about I don't know hour to a listening to it, I was like, "All right, I get what he's doing. I totally get this now. This is all." Awesome. It, was just, <laughs> it was just eye opening for me, you know yeah. that you know because at that point, you know, in the early in late eighties, early nineties, most guys, you know, it was everything was on time and everything was you know in rhythm and this and that. And then you had guys like Busta, and it was just like, totally different. And I was just like, it hey, just Jay, blew my mind. Jay, yeah. Not to cut you off, but was you working with Busta whenever he was doing tracks with Dilla? Uh, Dilla was around, yeah, a little bit while we were working on stuff, yeah. Okay, that's all I need. That's all I wanted to ask. Yeah. Yeah, man. Is my microphone? I changed to a different mic. It's perfect right there. Okay. Yeah, that's good. 
I guess I, it's my computer, guys, so every now and then I, I'm going to have to switch over to another microphone so that I guess it has to reset. My computer's dying, y'all, for those of you that are watching. Hang in with us, you know. <laughs> if it gets crazy, y'all, alert me if it starts messing up because I can't hear it on my end. And then I'll switch to another mic, and then that should clear it up until it messes up again. <laughs> okay. Um, yeah, yeah, that offbeat thing, boy, I love that. Um, it took me a minute to get used to D'Angelo, but it's like there's something about – see, the, here's the thing, too, that um, I want everybody to realize, too. A lot of these things, like you said, this, see, this stuff is being done on purpose. If everybody else, you know, we're, we're coming off of the stuff that's so quantized, drum machines came out, and everything was so spot on that some folks realize that this is too spot on, you know. So that's why, you know, there was a time, and most people don't recognize it now, but there was a time when quantization was exact, exact, and then it made stuff too ro robotic. But everybody was, was hyping that at first, saying, it makes your stuff exactly on time. You know, that was the selling point of it. But then people realized that was not a good thing necessarily. <laughs> you know? and, and another so, thing that's cool about Dilla, he didn't quantitize nothing. Yeah, like, yeah. His stuff was all his own personal groove. Like, yeah, I, I yeah. try to incorporate that sometime, but like like we say to the untrained listener, they're going to they're gonna look at it like, he don't know what he's doing. Versus yeah. the other people like us will be like, oh, yeah, he's doing that on purpose. Yeah, you know, right. Dilla would just grab the pads on on the MPC and just start playing, start and playing. keep it the way it was. You know, if there was an off hat or an off symbol or an off something that he had in the groove, he didn't care. It just gave it that much more humanity and everything else. It was it was it was it was it was, it was an eye opening experience for me, because you got to realize at that time again the same thing. You had you had like you know. The Lindrum, and you had all these sequences and stuff coming out that were just like everything was straight and solid and this and that. All that stuff went out with gated reverbs, man. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Well, exactly. you know, one, one thing I wanted to say about, about quantizing is that you have entire producers that created a career out of step loading and quantizing. Yeah. So, so while it's not, you know. When you got music as part of your dialogue, it's thicker, you know. And but you got a lot of young producers who, at the time, they had music as part of their dialogue, but they had adapted their their creativity to using these tools. Uh, Teddy Riley would have not have done New Jack if it had not been for the quantizing sound of Swing. the Atari yeah. computer. Okay, yeah. the Atari computer had on it a a quantization sound that it affected it had on anything that was done in it that gave him the structure that anything he did really had a really nice swing on it. So when he was doing his stuff, it was a combination of things. And quantizing was one of the tools he used. You know, but he used it in a way where he noticed there was a difference between when he did the sequencing on an Atari ST which is this? These are early machines, so you can go back and Google them if you want, see what they look like. Uh, with what was then called C Lab or or the early version of Logic Interface. Yep, Notator. Um, and then there also, uh, not to mention uh, Oberheim, Lynn. We all had. I was at Oberheim, but I've worked on Lynn machines and everything else. Each company had its own quantization uh, uh, formula because we were all using similar processors. So, you know, not to get too heady or too brainy, but basically those tools were designed as crutches for people who didn't really know. So part of the, the thing that happened is the music now became aided by a crutch. Well, oh. people figured out how to make the crutch sound hit. Gotcha. And then that hip crutch sound became a sound. <laughs> that was the selling point, Dave. That was the whole selling point. You put it exactly on time, but really they called themselves trying to um, emulate what loud drummers had been doing. Right, right. But 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 because, you know, and I still say to this day, you know, um, and I, I say this to people all the time, um, you know, there's some tremendous company. Native Instruments has a tremendous product, product line uh, of, of things. But if we break it all down to what do they make, they make crutches. They make crutches <laughs> because they make, they make a tool that is designed to aid oh, people oh. who don't necessarily understand the fullness and the structure and the language of music.
But what? But what if you? Can I just say how much I love you right now? I just love you. <laughs> right? I love you. Well, right? I'm, I'm just trying to put it in some other words. I'm not trying to. I'm not trying to bounce Native Instruments out of the room. I'm just trying to be honest. When we assess products and we look at things and we say, "Hey, they got this latest thing over here. They got that over there." Because I go into these camps and I see it all the time. And at the end of the day, it's it's a it's an aid to you not wanting to learn the traditional way. Not that everybody has to do that because we're in 2014 now. Everybody can learn the way they want. They will learn after a while that you inevitably have to roll up your sleeves and get with your Mel Bay basic guitar book or whatever it's going to be to give you an uh, introduction to structure. You know? but, um, but how do you feel? Okay, first off, back to the Lindrum. I love the Lindrum, and I love quantitize. It just particular particular time time and places like, I love 80s music. I'm a Prince baby. Like I got Prince books all over this room. Like I did a B battle. I did a B battle, right? Uh -huh. And I played this 80s joint, and of course I used Lynn Drum. And right. they was like, they was like, the one of the judges was like, we can tell you studied this sounds spot on, like an 80s record. I'm just looking like it ain't that I'm a student. It's just I love that sound so much that I right. had to know exactly what it was. Yeah. And like you said about Native Instruments. Like native, like native instruments to me for a musician. Oh man, that's like open up a whole new galaxy. Cause like I just study, I just I've been studying MIDI orchestration, and uh -huh. using and using uh, native instruments along with IK Multimedia's Philharmonic Orchestra. Uh huh. When I tell you, it sounded like, like. Lately, every time I work with an artist, they thinking I'm sampling something. They like, where's that sample from? I'm like, this is all me, baby. Like, don't don't disrespect me. Like, no. Nah, yeah, you got you the crutches too, right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. For the for the average cat, yeah, it's it's definitely gonna be a crush because they not gonna fully understand why this stuff was made like it was. Like, I went to I went to SAE, so I, I'll I'll get to the I've been at the point where I used to use drum kits. But now I'll actually go in the studio, book a session, yeah. mic up a drum kit, and just sample it myself, and then just go home and use them drums so nobody can say, oh, man, I got that same drum kit. No, you don't. Right, right. But it's, you know, I think I think it's good that you see the, the, the beauty of, of using a tool. We'll call it a tool. A crutch sometimes has a negative I mean, I, We'll call it a crutch for those that are not musically inclined. Yeah, <laughs> but, yeah that, that's but, good. But a tool, a tool and blame for, it on me if anybody wants to write it. <laughs> <laughs> but a tool is definitely in the toolbox. Yeah, I I think it's good. You know, it's good that we have those things. But I inevitably, after being around uh, many seasons, I can tell everybody that, in all honesty, what happens is whether you enter with your you know studio full of crutches and very little musical stuff, or you enter with a lot of musical stuff and a couple of crutches. Either way. You you will get wooed into a relationship with music in some kind of way, shape, or form. That's inevitably what happens the more you work with it. You will not get away from this thing without stepping to a higher level of understanding of structure, transition, or any of the stuff. So you you kind of have to start approaching it with a with an open mind, even to the point of where you you realize what you know. You also look at these products for how they can help support what you want to do even in some cases like you say dealing with orchestration you know these that's that's inevitably where sampling started you know sampling started because people wanted to to be able to create musical ideas in an affordable fashion so and everybody cannot afford an orchestra and it's to the <laughs> point now so if you are a musician and you make records people don't even second guess or don't even first guess that you did that all originally they right. think they think you sampled it it's like and when you tell them you didn't this is the sad part when you tell them you didn't sample it they sit at amazement but if you look at back in the 80s and 70s these this is what we sampling years yeah. stuff that they did years ago like it's supposed to be that like that now but instead <laughs> i think sampling made people lazy also instead of just going back yeah. i mean instead of it just did. Yeah, get to the point where they could take lessons. Cause I was talking about this the other day, cause we had a hangout and we were talking to a cat. I mean, I'm sure it's a few of y'all that <laughs> came up in the era of recording with tape. And when I was in school, we got to use tape. And I was like thinking about how we make music today, and I'm like, we are so spoiled. 
people back yeah. in the day really had to work for that record. Like you had to work for that record. Yeah, now, yeah. Now, yeah. I mean, excuse my language, you ain't got to do shit. I promise you. I can sit right here and make a whole album, and if I didn't feel like my performance was on point today, I can come back two or three months from now. As to oppose back then, you had to get it right because that tape was expensive. Yeah. We were yeah. talking about this. We were talking yeah. about this a couple weeks ago in one of the yeah. hangouts we were doing as far as, you know, maybe it was last week's hangout. As yeah, far as the caliber of the, the musician has changed totally. You know, being in in, stu in studios with guys, you know, that, that record and do stuff all the time, guys like Lukather and Verhan and, you know, Steve Smith and all these guys that are just these monster studio musicians that, you know, they can walk in any given day and just have it. You know, mm -hmm. it's just there. It's on. They just turn on the faucet and the water's hot and it's good. Mm -hmm. You know, it's just the way it is. You know, yeah. but I totally agree with that, Gavin. Yeah. Old. Well, you know what? I also want okay, to look. Thing. I'm, I'm gonna tell you this. I'm 27, but I was raised by my grandparents, and I'm from the Delta. So. You got the real deal, Delta Delta Delta. Years is 47. Look, <laughs> yeah, yeah. I don't. Well, I be all, trying to tell people I'm from the Delta, and people don't understand what that means. The Delta is. I understand all y'all come from different walks of life. The Delta is like a walking time machine. Like we literally, it's it's still segregated. So I'll put you like that. So yeah. I'm yeah. really, I'm really, I'd say I'm about 50, 55. So like yeah. I, I collect, rec I still collect records. Like I know a lot of people do it, but I've been doing this since I was a kid. Hey, you know, and, and one thing people should do is uh, do some wait, research. Wait, 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 before you finish, because I'm going to go get something to eat. I cried when Bobby Womack died, so that's how that that should let you know how real it is. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Will, People should research the Delta, though. You know, yeah, you're gonna absolutely. find that a lot of uh, a lot of music, a lot of what goes on in music, can be directly traced back to the Mississippi Delta experience. Yeah, yeah. and that is part of what is being. Uh, you know, subtly erased today by the way people kind of care for the history of music. I'll yeah, just say people that. These days are going down to the crossroads and selling their soul to the devil. Oh, all right, all right. Hey, hey guys, listen, I want to get on, uh, I guess I guess you pronounce it Jay Shine. Um, Mr. Jay Shine, he wants to introduce himself to everybody and chime in on our conversation as well. So come on, Awesome. Back. All right, you guys can hear me pretty good? Yeah, we got you. Okay. Um, well, first, again, Mr. Glover, you know, I want to thank you for uh, having me here. I've been watching a couple times, and uh, been watching you over YouTube, doing um, some Sweetwater stuff. Cool. Um, hey, do me a favor. Okay. Do me a favor before you continue. Can you turn uh -huh. your camera down a little bit? Static. Get the top of your, the top of your head. Uh, how about I'll just kind of sit up. That's the lowest. Okay, yeah, that, yeah, that's good. Cool. Okay. Um, and to everyone else, hey, how y'all doing? Um, uh, I guess I'll give a, a very fast um, background. Um, so basically, I'm a guy from the South. I, I forgot what he said, uh, the guy that just left. Um, he said he was from, but I'm from a small town that's kind of like that um, in South Carolina, a little town called Walterboro. Uh -huh. And um, now I'm residing in uh, Douglasville, Georgia, about 20 minutes outside of downtown Atlanta. And um, musically wise, uh, I've been, I grew up in music, grew up in church, um, started on the drums, but it was too many drummers in the church. So um, my cousin, he was about to go off to college and uh, so I decided to pick up the next instrument that would be uh, vacated, which is the piano. Um, sorry, that's my wife. Um, and so, <laughs> and so, uh, basically, a grip of church playing the keyboard, playing the drums, um, bass guitar, lead guitar. But keyboard and drums is my my first two um, loves and the things that I'm most uh, fluent, uh, you know, proficient at. Uh, but as far as musical background, um, I went to the military first uh, to the United States Air Force. And then when I got out in 2011, um, then I decided I finally wanted to go to music school. Now I have, you know, the funds or whatever to be able to go. So first I went to uh, the Art Institute of Atlanta. I went there about a year and a half, um, but then moved out here to Douglasville. Couldn't take the drive every day there. So did some online classes through Berkeley, um, got a certificate through them, um, but still wanted to go to school. So he said he went to SAE. Um, I, that was actually a school I was looking at just recently, but decided to go with Full Sail. Um, and so... Um, you know, I've done some music theory, um, you know, basically to get my um, chops up on the keyboard. 
Um, you know, I'm more of a, I count myself more of a producer more than oh well a musician producer more than like a musician who would go and try to play for different groups. Um, live musician. Um, I would count myself more of a studio musician, but um, you know that's kind of that's, that hasn't been an advantage for you as far as um, you know just being able to help you because we're talking about today the advantages of, of stacking on your education. You know, many people, myself included, started out just from learning by ear and what we picked up, yeah. and then I got better from stacking on a more formal training. You know, I actually wish I could have gone to uh, full sale or SAE as a student. <coughs> Excuse me as a student or something like that because I mean I think those are valuable as well too although I, I, I love the way I learned digging in and getting real work real, real yeah. work experience there's nothing like it so what's an yeah. advantage for you? Um, actually this has been a, a big advantage um, you know I, I grew up playing by ear um, and one of the reasons why I, was, why I wanted to go to music school is because I was doing at that at that time I didn't know what it was called but uh, after doing music theory, then you know I was doing inversions and all that kind of stuff, but that was just based off a of sound. I didn't know I was actually doing it. So when somebody was like, "Hey man, put me an A," or the preacher's like, "Put me an F," and I'm sitting there, I'm like, "You just start talking and I'll find you." <laughs> and so, uh, and, and so that was main, one of the main reasons why I wanted to go to music school was to put a title to what it was I was doing. Um, and since then, um, I've already been, I've always been pretty clean, keen with the ear. To where um, I can listen to a record, almost replicate the whole thing by just listening to it maybe once or twice. Um, that's just how my ears are with sound. But I knew I know that that will take me but so far. Um, somebody may come and put sheet music in front of my face, and I won't know what to do. And so um, that was one of the reasons why I wanted to go to music school, um, particularly for the keyboard, but also um, engineering uh, because you know I, I count engineering and production as almost the same thing. Um, and so, uh, as far as an advantage or anything like that, it's definitely been a great advantage, uh, at least for me. I could tell a, a huge difference in productions, um, even down to when I'm adding in string parts. You know, before it was more of a hold the note strings and blend it in, but now I'm able to put my staccatos and all kind of stuff in there to make it sound more realistic than just some MIDI drawn out holding notes. Yep, yep. Um. Yeah, and just to let you guys know, those of you who got on here late, like I said, my computer is having issues. I've had it for a while, so it's time to get another Mac Pro. This is on my tower, and um, I've got a whole bunch of different mics in here. I've got, you know, a mixer wired in, USB mics and all that, and what lets me know is everything across the board is going crazy. These hangouts usually go very smoothly, but... Occasionally my audio is getting screwed up now because everything is just starting to die. I think my motherboard is starting to go or something. Oh, man. So if I switch um, microphones, that seems to clear it up for a second, and then it gets bad again, and then I have to keep switching. So that's what it is. It's um, it's it's crazy. Yeah, it's driving me crazy. The last few Hangouts we've done have been like crazy, so I have to spend a few grand and get a new computer now. Um, I've been putting enough Band-Aids on it, but the Band-Aids ain't working anymore, so... Oh, well, <laughs> sorry, guys, sorry, hang in there. That's why I'll let you guys talk mostly. Such is the life we live these days. <laughs> but that's it, man. Ain't, there's nothing worse because, like, you know, you want to put off changing out a computer as long as possible because you know how much hassle that is, getting all your software back and everything working and talking to each other and driver issues and all that. I mean, although Mac is still pretty good, you still got to go through a decent bit. And um, I've got a backup, luckily, but I've still found that even having backups, you still have to, you know, change up stuff and all that. And if I'm going to do it now, I'm going to get a new computer. Now I'm going to probably either upgrade to, um, I'm going to definitely either try Mavericks. I waited because I was on Mountain Lion. I'm still on Mountain Lion right now for for the Mac. I'll, I'll always wait for a while before I upgrade. I didn't upgrade to Mavericks, and now they've got the new one. Now, what's the new one called? Um What's the new operating system for the Mac? It's just just Mavericks. No, no, there's a new one out that they just they just you said oh, just come out. Yeah. Another um, one already. Yeah, they got a new one now. Yeah, so Mavericks is old already. Wow. <laughs> yeah, yeah. I can't think of the name of it now, but um, yeah, I'm not gonna I'm not gonna do that one for a while. Yeah. yeah. That's, that's the new one they got. All right. So anyway, guys, um, I think um, Yosemite. That's what it is. Andrew put it on there. 
Thanks, Andrew. Yeah, I couldn't um, remember what the name of it was. Um, so don't even start. Joe's talking about time for a PC. <laughs> I had no idea. <laughs> even trying to go there. For, you got jokes. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Hey, man, Andrew. I mean, um, uh, uh, Joseph, we still got to figure out how to get your PC on so that we can play some audio, you know. And um, any of you other guys, you know, um, oh, and, and Mr. J. Shine, is that how I'm, are we pronouncing it? Correct? That's right. Okay. That's right. Mm -hmm. Cool, cool. Um, uh, I want to maybe get you, uh, you got any music or anything yeah. you can play for us and demonstrate? Yeah, you got here? yeah, I have some. Hey, Jay Shine. Yes, sir. Hey, how far are you from Columbus? Because I live in Columbus, Georgia. I'll be moving, I'll be moving to Atlanta in October. Like Columbia, November. Georgia? Yeah. Uh, man, might be an hour and a half. Might yeah, be. Yeah, I've, I've been in that. Columbia, Georgia for about eight months. Oh, okay. Yeah, I've only been here about almost a year now. Yeah, we'll definitely link up. Oh, yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah. Um, but how yeah, would I play the music for you guys? Like how? Well, right now, unless you don't know how to hook it into the system to play it. Or are you on a Mac or PC, first of all? Um, I'm on a Mac. Um... The way I know how to do it is, but I would have to hook up uh, my Focusrite interface and use the loopback function. Uh, oh, right okay. now, I'm just running it through the um, UAD. Okay, yeah. Um, we won't go through all that right now. Yeah. You can just play it over the speakers, and um, all right, I'll find uh, some right. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to put my thing in studio mode. Um, put yours in studio mode, too. I think that might make a difference in how it sounds to us. Studio mode? Uh, through yeah. the speakers? Yeah, do you know how to do studio well, let me, uh, I'm sorry, say that again. Little gear. Go up to the gear that's up yep. the top in the Hangout and then change it from voice mode to studio mode. Oh, okay. And then click save. All right, and cool. We should get a little better quality, even though it's picking it up over the speakers. It should be a little better. All right, this is something I just was working on today. So, okay. let me, uh... Oh, wait, I got to put it in my speakers. All right. Alright. Y'all can hear that pretty good? So far, can hear you. Okay. Basically, that's something I'm just working on right there. But yeah. Oh, cool, oh, cool, cool. Now, now um, um, okay, okay, go, ahead, uh, go, go, go back, back to your, your headphones for a second because okay. we got the uh, feedback pattern. I want to I want to ask you about I want to ask you about that uh, groove because uh, I don't know if it was the hangout itself. Um, okay, I'm, I, do I first of all do I have static going on again? Do I need to switch my mic, guys? No, you're oh, good right now. Oh, is it good? Okay. Yeah. Oh, a couple of people said yes, it's static, and a couple of people said sort of. But okay, well, I just want to. Um, asked you there was like a little weird rhythmic turnaround i don't know if that was this the uh hangout you know doing its thing because sometimes it stutters or was uh, that built into the groove um no nah, it was a i mean it was a pretty straightforward groove um definitely wasn't no turnarounds oh, okay. um yeah it was pretty much and that was probably yeah that was me you know yeah so I'm, yeah, that's my computer. Okay, that's what I wanted to know. Yeah, it was sounding good from what I could uh, tell of it, though. It was sounding good, man. You know, tell us a little bit about it. Um, really, the way I kind of approach um, every day is um, majority of the time I don't have nothing in my head. Um, and then when I do have something in my head, then I know it's golden. But um, I'll come and uh, usually um, I actually learned this from Teddy Riley um, on a pre Um He was talking. He said... Um, a lot of times when you're going through that drought of uh, producer's block, you know, you just go through, find you a good loop that it kind of get you started. And then, uh, you know, pretty much it'll kind of clear your mind up and you start thinking of things around, they'll build around it. So uh, with this track, um, the 
um, the uh, the main chord. The dun, 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 dun. That's actually a loop that I pitched down, and then uh, and then I just built all the drums and everything else around that. Um, and then you know the next step would obviously be some strings and stuff like that. But that's about cool. it. Oh, okay. Mm -hmm. Cool. Cool. Yeah. Um, what do you have in mind for it? Is it gonna be like, for example, is it gonna have any uh, vocals or anything like that on it? Is it gonna have a rap? Um, what? what? Now that I don't know, I mean a fast a fast type uh, singing vocal or a more up tempo um, R and B track would probably fit that. But then at the same time with the groove, somebody can rap on the top of that too. I mean I don't have a direction for it as far as vocals, um, but I definitely know I won't use it for myself. But you know, be for somebody else. But okay, cool, 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 cool. That's cool, man. Um, check, check, check. Am I still crack a y'all? No, you're good. <laughs> check, check, check. Okay. Yeah, these guys got got jokes here, and <laughs> they're loving it. Mm -hmm. How are you? If you switch, if you switch over to one more mic, you gonna have to perform. I swear, brother. I'm telling you, I'm gonna give you all the real live version of James Brown. Huh? Mm -hmm. <laughs> get me. It's like try me. It's trying me, y'all. <laughs> uh, yeah. All right. Well, um, you know, um, we touched on a good subject today. If anybody wants to close it out, because I think uh, you know, it was an interesting thing. Um. I really think that um, building on your education um, really helps musically. And like I said, too, um, later on in another hangout, too, we'll dig more into even the business side of it, you know, because I really learned a lot stacking on top of what I needed to know for having a publishing company, for example, production, production companies, companies and, and things, things like that, like that you, know. you know. So we'll, so we'll, 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 we'll dig we'll into dig that on another, another pretty soon. Anybody else Anybody got any final, final words or anything on that? On that? Can you hear hey, me through hey. this uh, handheld oh, mic? Oh, 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 yeah, I'm hearing yeah, feedback, feedback from somebody. somebody though. Though. Uh oh, that could be somebody me again. Got their got their speakers hat. Hat. I have my speakers off, but I was gonna hit play on a uh, session because I think I got this PC thing figured out. Let's hear, let's hear. Let's Check it. it. Hello. Yes. yes. I'm gonna hit play. See what happens. Any sound? Yeah, 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 we can hear, we can hear. Yeah, it works for me, yeah, it works for me. You heard music? Really? That's cool, that's cool. Oh, ah! And we heard, and we it, heard it in stereo. stereo. That's the whole idea, my main man. Except for when I talk, it's echoing. Yeah, we can hear, yeah, we can hear. Only, only, only when we're on the mic and mic coming through your speaker, your speaker. I don't have my speakers on at all, so I've got a loop somewhere, and I'm not sure where with this microphone. Yeah, yeah. I think it's, I think it might be somebody, might be somebody else. else. Okay. I don't, I don't see, I don't see I don't anybody on the meters moving. moving. No, 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 it's probably, probably the loop, loop that three, three, three. Hmm. Okay, well, okay, I'm going to just well, go ahead and manual, manual, manual mute everybody, everybody, everybody to be sure. Be sure. I think everybody's always muted, muted, though. Okay, so I'm... Uh, so when I talk, you hear the uh, some kind of loop back. No, no wind thaw, thaw, we, we hear ourselves self coming back, back to us. Gotcha. Okay. I well, how can that happen when you guys aren't in my my <laughs> at this microphone? I don't get it. It's this you're not coming out coming to the play and directly, like, directly like loop like back. Loop back. You see, you see. Your computer, Your computer plays, plays audio. 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 And, and then, then, then it comes back, back to the computer, the computer and not just not speakers, speakers into, the into the mic. That is, that so, is so weird. weird. Yeah, it's it is. Weird, I, weird I'm, not, I'm not catching on for some reason. Well, just play the music, play the music and, uh, and we'll, uh, hear. we'll hear it. And are you and in are studio, you in studio mode? mode? Joseph, Joseph? Yeah. Okay, yeah. Okay, yeah. And I, and I am. am. We so should be good. We should yeah. be good. And now, am I still creating this loop issue for you guys? It seems to be okay, okay, okay now, now, huh? Okay, we'll go okay, ahead and we'll play, play, and play it for us now. All right, cool. I think we're All okay. Right. We're okay.
my coffin now Your foot's on the table But I'm unable Found and lost somehow Situation stable I cut the cable Was that you was on that guitar? You on guitar? Uh, some of it was me. Uh, I oh, okay, okay. Some, uh, for copyright and all that legal crap, I went to. Uh, uh, that, I, basically, what I did is I used. Uh, when I bought the 11 rack, I got a copy of Pro Tools with that. Mm -hmm. 10 and 11 install native. I never used it because I already had an HD rig. So. And I had updated the HD rig already. All right. So what I did is with my computer that I built for my house, I uh, I just formatted a new drive desk and installed that uh, software, uh, that native software on that desk. Long story short, I just set, created a, a, a native rig. All right. And I had to figure out how to get it to you guys. And Bill was saying last time I talked to him that. Somehow I had to get a hard line from the interface into the sound card that was already in the computer. 
And that's right, basically right. all I did. I took an eighth inch mini and ran it right into the sound card. And that's that, it, it. I, once I did that, it gave me the option under the little gear on the settings to pick that sound card as the input. That's it. That's and it. That's all it's all it's all it's we're not getting any ring backs now, you know, or any looping issues. Are we still working okay with that? So far, so we, far we, we, we can we hear, can hear you, you okay. okay. The only problem, the only problem is, is um, um, when I'm talking, well, I'm, talking I'm, coming now, over, I'm coming over the system, the system again, again speeding, speeding back. back. So, so I'm, I'm here, here in LA. LA. Well, what I did is I just took the, I, I trimmed the, uh, I completely turned the trim down on the uh, microphone. Yeah, yeah. It's, it's me, it's me. It's what what it is, what it is, we probably need a mix minus setup. What is that? That's when that's you send the mix the minus, mix minus the, uh, the, uh, the, the, the source, source like me, like me for example, for example, where I'm coming back, back, but I don't want to hear myself, myself back. back. I'll hear everything, I'll hear else. everything else. But, but um, um, that's, that's for another, for another time. time. We'll, 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 it's basically, basically how if you were setting up to do podcasting or something like that, you know, and you had a phone call or call in or something. It's basically the same same type of theory. You would have to send it up on the sense. Uh, I don't hear you now. Did did we lose you? Did something okay. change? Okay. Okay. Yeah, we okay. Lost. Yeah, we lost you. Now yeah, we're back. back now. Okay. Just gonna switch off of this crap and go right. Okay. Back. Yeah. Just switch off back the way it was. Um, it sounded good, man. Though we'll talk about it. Did that work, or did I lose yeah, everybody? Yeah, we can hear. We can hear you. Okay, and I'm not causing you guys any problems now. No. Uh -uh. Okay. Cool. You can hear us. Okay, right. Oh, anyway, so the quick of it, that part is, I grabbed something off the internet that was set up for a contest, so it could be played publicly without any implications. Cool. Okay, that. So this is some other person's recording work, and all I did was just add a bunch of. Uh, stuff to it to make it wow. sound cool and i kept their vocals and the gist of their their thing you know did you do did you do the guitar solo was that you um yeah some of it's whoever did the original recording and some of it's me i combined it in uh i was asking did you do the solo yes okay cool and some of the rhythm parts and all that did or anything else did you replace anything or is it just um I added more uh, beats to the drum. Okay, cool. Their drum line, they sent, you know, they had their drum tracks as just one two track with all the drums mixed already. And it didn't have enough hit, so I decided to, uh, you know, copy paste some uh, snare hits and a couple other things in there. Well, can you let everybody know where did you get that track from? And are there other resources like that? Because that's good. Um, to I to went to Indaba, just the front page on Indaba. Right, right. Okay, yeah. So, yeah, I, yeah. I do that many times, too. Okay. They ha they do have different rights issues as far as how things, you know, certain things can only be done for certain purposes or times. But because this is educational, right. I think it's a fair use thing where it wouldn't be no problem. Bill has already talked about some of the other um, sites that, he has uh, turned us on to previously mm -hmm. so yeah we're going to get more into stuff like this and okay. um do that but yeah that you know the, key, uh, the guy who did it, it the stuff sounded good the key thing i should probably say um, oh umphrey mcgee credit out to umphrey mcgee that is uh his work and he allowed uh people to do whatever they wanted to it and that is just for a specific period of time and I believe there's only a few more days left, and then I believe I at that point that I'm not allowed to do whatever I want with it. Okay, yeah, yeah. Okay, so that's why I went that route because I didn't want to step on anybody's toes. Yeah, no, that's that's good to do, and right. um, it, it was good to give attribution to them as well. Yes. Um, it, it's more, you know, spreading the love and spreading yes. uh, the, their talent as well. So mm -hmm. we're gonna be able to do more things like this. That's one thing. Another thing when we were talking about you know, the education and law and things like that. We'll be dealing with certain things a little more like that is how much we can do inside these Hangouts. Because Google, YouTube, for example, you know, that's why I don't play any um, music in here because a couple of times when I did it, you know, I'll get the notice back that you're playing copyrighted material and, you know, 
we can't have no infractions and stuff like that. So it's definitely better to get stuff like this where you can do it. And um, I know there's also um, the the uh, fair use. There's there's a fair use um, part of the law where you can use certain things for um, demonstration and educational purposes. As long as, you know, as long as you're not redistributing to try to make some money from it and things like that. So we'll discern you know the differentiation points on that. Yeah. That would be very good to uh, learn, you know, as yeah. a group because uh, it really is a touchy thing and some folks could get, uh, you know, I definitely wouldn't want to step on anybody's toes or take any creative uh, 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 kudos away from anybody who has allowed uh, me or some other individuals to mess with their material. Yeah, you know, add and subtract whatever we want, etc. You know. Yeah, it's all licensing mm -hmm. thing. You know, there's some stuff with the Creative Creative Commons licensing and stuff like that, where mm -hmm. some people will allow you to deal with that, and everybody can pretty much make the rules the way they want. So, it just has to be researched. Unfortunately, a lot of times, like some of the better stuff that sounds good, like that, that sounded really good coming right out the box off of Indaba, and you can find a lot of good high, high quality stuff like that. Sometimes the uh, you know, you really got to investigate what's allowed and what's not allowed on, on places like that with better stuff, you know. Yeah, I did have to manipulate that track quite a bit, you know. I think they gave me uh, seven or eight tracks, ten tracks, and I ended up with about 15. Oh, cool, cool. You know, by the time I was done. But uh, anyway, it was a lot of fun, and I didn't want to, you know, spend any time on that, really. I just wanted to before you guys hung up, make sure I had it figured out finally. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Yeah, no, that was about cool, my twenty fifth try. <laughs> <laughs> that sounded good. Thanks, that man. Good. Yeah, that's Thank cool. you very much. Hey, we got Kenny Joy has joined us on here. Um, mm hmm Yeah, he, I guess he's getting tied in and everything. So Kenny, whenever you mm -hmm. get going, mm -hmm. just say hello to everybody. We're gonna be wrapping it up shortly anyway, but uh, maybe you can chime in on what we're talking about. Yeah, uh, and just to let everybody know that's been watching uh, today, we're just talking about basically, you know, adding on to your education. You know, uh, if you got here late, like myself and a lot of other people started out as ear musicians. You know, we just got in because we love music and let our ear lead us. Many of you probably start out the same way. So we're discuss discussing the pros and cons and advantages or if there's any downside to actually learning music learning more about your career or, or learning business where if you want to have a publishing company production companies and things like that the laws and things that like that'll that you need to know about and the education you need to bring in to take it to the next level so that you can continue and stretch your education there's a wall we got, kept talking about that wall that everybody will reach if they only kind of go on what naturally gets them going that's a starting point you know i I started out as a musician by ear. I'm still mainly a musician by ear, but I learned at least a little bit about why and wherefores of um, music, how it moves, why it moves. You know, we discuss things like about is something learning something as simple as I'd always heard about the cycle of this, cycle of force, and all that. And um, later on, we'll even get into it a little bit deeper because it's like um, we had Gavin on here, and Gavin held up a chart that he's dealing with, and at the top of the chart it says cycle of fifth. And there's a distinguishing thing on this whole concept that I didn't learn for a lot of while because that's the first thing I saw as a guitar player. I saw the cycle of fifths. But then later on, as I started studying music, I, I learned that music, as far as how we hear it, moves in the cycle of fourths. Whole nother thing. Now, they're really one and the same because one's just flipped. You know, we'll get into it later on because there's little things like... Um, you know, these intervals, you know, the opposite interval, when you add it, it adds up to nine. You know, so if you have the cycle of fourths and the cycle of fifths, you know, when you flip them, they're opposites of each other. The, the cycle of fifths is when you go, you can go up a perfect perfect fifth, you know, and, or and, and then that'll take you to the fifth, but then you go down to the root, you know, whereas the cycle of fourth is perfect fourth, but that going up to that fourth, the fourth beca can become the root if you're moving according to harmonically how it's going to sound because it's actually moving five one 
you know, but the actual intervals of four. We won't get into that. I don't want to confuse you, but sound, the way music sounds as opposed to the way it's written out and as opposed to the way it's explained in theory can become very, very confusing. In fact, I want to get Jason on it because that, that he might be able to even touch on that. That was a whole huge thing for me when I realized because I, the first thing I saw was the cycle of fifths. You got to learn the cycle of fifths. And everything and I start learning that and going from C to G, which is the fifth jump, but then realizing that the sound, the sound of music naturally, naturally moves to the, the sound of four, C to F. F. So, so somebody else chime in on that because that might be a, 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 a revelation for somebody on here that doesn't actually know that. Um, Gavin, Jason, any of you guys? Or anybody, anybody else? else? Yeah, uh, we're getting that feedback again. Um, who was that that just tried to talk? Go ahead and talk again. That was Jason that just tried. tried. To... Can you hear me now? Uh, uh, yeah, yeah, Jason. Jason? Yeah, all right. I just want to make sure this is working. Do you, you have the speaker off? off? I, I'm hearing feedback. All right. Uh, give me a minute. Okay. Um, uh, Gavin or, or um, uh, the other Jason? I want uh, Jason Constantine. I'll be back in just a minute, guys. I got a client here. Oh, okay, cool, cool. Gavin, All right, what'd you, what'd you just say, Cleet? Well, I was basically talking about, remember you held, in fact, do you still have your cycle of fourth, uh, cycle of fifths chart? Right here. Okay, he's, uh, let me put it on here. Uh, guys, you'll see this. He's holding up a cycle of fifth charts. And you notice going clockwise, it goes C to G to D to A to E, et cetera, et cetera, around clockwise. It's counterclockwise, the circle of, cycle of fourths. And the cycle of fourths goes counterclockwise. Okay, e, cool. F, B flat, E flat, A flat, D flat, etc. You know, now the sound of music actually goes counterclockwise towards the cycle of fourths. But the title of that chart says cycle of fifths. And that was very confusing to me at first because I always start, I started out learning and hearing about, well, you got to learn the cycle of fifths. And so I learned it from that. But that's not how the sound of music naturally moves. The sound of music naturally moves the cycle of uh, fourths. Move, you know, C, F, B flat, E flat, A flat, D flat, G flat, you know, it moves that way naturally, you know, um, as, um, uh, as far as how we hear it. And that's a distinguishing thing that a lot of people don't know or probably don't realize, you know, you may be doing it naturally, you know. So, um, you know, you know, when you hear things about the two, five, one progression, that's moving in the cycle of force. You know, two to five is moving up a perfect fourth, two to the five, and five to one is moving up another perfect fourth to that to that root, you know, and to the key of the song. You know, music naturally moves in the counterclockwise manner as far as what's listed on that cycle, the way we hear it. Theoretically, it goes according to the cycle of fifths going clockwise, you know, because C, the natural harmonic of C is G, which is the fifth. That's the natural first harmonic, you know, of it. And so there's the theoretical way music moves in the cycle of fifths, and then there's the way it naturally moves in nature, which is the way we hear it. It naturally moves in cycle of fourths, and people have to know that difference. If you don't know that difference, you can easily... You know, most it's really not something that you have to know because you're naturally going to move according to the way it, what sounds good. And it's going to sound good moving in that way. But knowing the, dif the the differentiating points of that and what distinguishes one from the other, I think is helpful just having the knowledge of it. Um, Gavin, go ahead. I'm sorry. Oh no, I ain't had I ain't had no, nothing to say. I just that's why I asked when you kept saying circle of fours. I'm looking like. Like, did I miss a step in, in, in learning this stuff? And then I had to think about it. Wait a minute. Ain't the circle of fours is when it go counterclockwise and you just confirmed it. So, yeah, 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 when I was in orchestra, like, when I was in orchestra, you could tell I probably didn't pay attention. She probably did say something about the circle of fifths, but we, we always warmed up with a scale. It was always a major scale and a minor scale. Mm -hmm. And then we would play the scale of the, the song that we was about to learn. Mm-hmm. So, like I said, I'm 27, so the last 14 years, this is honestly the first time I just sat down with the circle of fifths and been every day waking up, playing, uh, playing each scale that I know already, and I add a new one at the end of it. So I practice that, and then I practice it before I go to sleep. 
So whenever I start doing chord progressions or inversions, my mind will be freely thinking of other scales instead of the ones that I've been using so heavily the last the last years. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It's very interesting. That was such a revelation to me because, like I said, we all naturally start out playing that way. And what confused me was, like I said, learning into the theory, you know, I naturally went through the cycle of fifths. So I started out going C, G, you know, uh, you know, uh, uh, just going through the whole cycle in the moving up perfect fifths. And um, that's and that sounds fine, you know, and everything. That's I said, that's how mu music moves theoretically with the harm harmonics, you know. So the perfect fifth, I could hear it, I can see it, you know, and all that. But when you know, in the moving music as far as the way it sounds moves perfect force so five moves to one you know that's the first perfect fourth that is natural you know two moves to five and then then five moves to one all those are fourths and i didn't know that for a long time and didn't realize that that's how it does when you listen to any jazz musician and when they say all music is based on basically two five one you can pretty much break down the most complicated thing if you break down what it's based on because it's all extensions everything is based on two five one it can go down to that and really based on five one you know and those of you that don't understand what i'm talking about if you're you know if, if, if you're more beginning and don't really know what i'm talking about don't worry about it these are just terms these are things that i just came to realize you know hanging out with herbie hancock and guys like this and talking with those guys and like realizing that all the super complicated stuff that we hear is all based on real simple stuff that keeps getting stacked on each other or starting in a different place. I heard Herbie play this amazing chord progression that blew me away. It was so harmonically rich based according to um, the music that I heard playing. Uh, I asked him what he was doing. Man, that sounds, that's, that's just bananas, man. What are you doing? And he laughed at me. He's like, colleague, he said, all I did was play a major triad. He said, the difference was I played it before everybody else arrived there, <laughs> you know? So you could hear him going to that, and it sounded like it was going through these other things, this major chord progression and everything, but he knows so much about music, and he knew how, where he was trying to go. A straight, ordinary major triad started taking all these extensions as the other parts were catching up to it taking on these little, little, you know, sharps and flats in certain areas and everything. And he knew how to do it in a way to find that perfect triad, a simple, the first thing you learn. And then he's like, ma'am, jazz and all that is built on the simplest things just stacked on each other or where you play them, you know. Huge revelation, little things like that, stuff that seems so complex, you know. Yeah. Anybody uh, else? Kelly, yeah, you know something that was this may really seem simple to everybody, but at the time when I when I was showed this, I I was having a hard time teaching myself the circle of fifths as it relates to my guitar in an easy way. Mm -hmm. And I was in a, a studio session and one of the guitarists there said, "Do you know the notes on the A string, fifth string?" And I said, mm -hmm. "Yeah." I do. He said, okay, well then, do you know how to play a simple major scale? Yes. He said, well then, you'll know the, you know the circle of fifths. And he showed me the shape, and starting at B, the second fret, playing this seven notes, mm -hmm. then moving to C, then moving one whole step to D, mm -hmm. E, and, then I, and I was like, holy shit, that's the circle of fifths. Uh, yeah. You know, on one string, using the same form all the way up the guitar, and it was like that was the that super light bulb moment for me, where I went, "Oh shit, it all makes sense now." I I think I got it. Well, that that's how it really opened the door for me to to start understanding how the other uh, scale shapes fit into the circle of fifth. You know how I could go from that ma major to a minor scale and know what key I'm in all the time. Even if yeah. I didn't know any other string, if that makes sense, you know, yeah, any other, you know, yes. And, and that, that really, that, that started the ball for me. Yeah, and yeah. I realized, I'm sorry. Yeah, no, I said, yeah, I was disagreeing with you. Yeah, yeah. Oh, and then, you know, and I looked at it and I said, okay, well, if I know the sixth string and the first string and the fifth string, 
well that's half of that's I got half the neck down I know half the notes on the entire guitar so then it, then it, it just made it all seem much easier at that point to learn the neck and yeah, yeah. Uh, yeah, it, that was that was my light bulb moment that helped take me to that next spot, you know. Yeah, I'll tell you another light bulb moment for as far as stacking on it um, is that uh, learning the, the concept of tetrachords. Does it, everybody here know what a tetrachord is? And Tetra. Tetrachord. Basically, you know, I mean, it's just a term, first of all, so... It is so Seven. simple, you know, when you learn all this, mm -hmm. but it's basically, you know, every major scale is built on on, on um, two tetrachords. They have a lower tetrachord and an upper tetrachord. It's the first four notes, which is um, do, re, mi, fa, and then you go up, move up a whole step, and then go sol, la, ti, do. So basically, that's four notes, the same form, you know, um, you go do, re, mi, fa, and then sol la ti do that if you split that right in the middle and put a whole note in between those two you've got the exact same form on both sides the lower tetrachord is it starts out say do is is your root then you move up a whole step re another whole step me and then to the fourth is a half step fa so do re mi fa so you count that as one entity then move up a whole step and do the exact same form as the next entity. So move up a, a whole step. La, move up another whole step. T, and then a half step to end on do. Do, they're the same, they're the same exact form. Whole step, whole step, half step. Whole step, whole step, half step. And when I started realizing that, it's like take this long, big scale and just chop it in half and remember those two, the, the, you got the lower half and the upper half. You can move that through any major scale. Now, the differentiating part is, is all you got to do is alter those two halves to make any chord that you want or any scale that you want. So say, for example, you alter the lower tetrachord and make it have a minor third instead of a major third, you know. So you go right. do, ha, and then whole step, re, and then me, which is the half step to make it a minor third, then, then fa, so that suddenly you have the minor part of that lower tetrachord that's the foundation of any minor chord. It's got to have a minor third, obviously. Right. So if you remember that, then you don't even have to think about that. That lower tetrachord basically has those two things to just differentiate between that major and minor. Now, when you have the half step, that's when you get into the modes and everything. But we won't deal with that. Just talking about basing it on a major scale and being able to build chords from that. Remember that one thing on the lower tetrachord. Now, the upper tetrachord is the same thing. You say, well, what happens if I if I make a half step instead of uh, having the half step between T and Do? If I made that a flat, like I flatted the third, I flat T. You know, so go make. Uh, in other words, if I make that the same shape as the lower tetrachord, what if I did that exact same thing with the upper tetrachord? Then I've got a minor seventh there. If I put them two together, suddenly I've got a minor seventh chord. Right. You know? It's real simple when you, I mean, it sounds more, I, I probably explained it terribly, but it's really like taking any major scale, chopping it in half between in half. the fourth and fifth. And then any alteration you do on the lower side can determine whether it's major or minor. And any alteration that you do on the upper side determines whether it's a major seventh or a minor seventh. So it's, whether it's major, you could have a minor, you could have a minor major seventh which is, uh, you know, you know, that's a chord, that's the seventh step of uh, any scale, or you can have a minor seven, or if you leave the lower half and leave it as major, but make a minor seventh on the upper tetrachord, then you have the dominant seventh, which gives you the mixolydian. I'm, I'm getting way too complicated on all that, yeah. but, it, but it just tripped me out when it's mm -hmm. like, wow, it's really that simple. If you chop that whole long scale that seems, you know, trying to remember that and think, I've got, okay, I've got two chunks here now, and let me just alter the chunks. I can get to anything I want from altering just two chunks. You right. know, it was, so it, it was uh, it was different, but it was called a tetrachord. And the the terminology terminology they got all these things that freak you out. You know when um when we heard about um like the modes and you know you know you learn you know the um uh Ionian mode, then Dorian mode, then going Phrygian, you know uh, Lydian, going through all those things and those names. And then they had another, um, uh, they had other terms for, for the exact same um, steps, 
but they had different names. All that stuff was so confusing to me. That's why I like um, thinking in terms of like like Nashville just uses the numbering system, the Nashville numbering system, because it's like take all the names out of it and just put numbers on it, you know, and it makes it a lot simpler. You know, if you know it's on this step and this is what it does, and uh, it makes life a lot simpler. Anyway, I, I digress and got off of that. <laughs> okay, but um, oh, that's good. Yeah. No, that that is good. That's a good point. And when you do remove some of those uh, freaky names and that terminology, and you put uh, simple numbers to it, it it can it changes the whole way your mind perceives it. You know, the yeah. difficulty. At least, at least for a lot of people, I know it does for me. Yep, yep, yep. So, um, you know, um, it, it, it's 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 a it's another thing though. But it, these things have been helpful to me now. So now, right now, I can hear music, and if I want to take it to another level, I can know in my mind now that if I'm hearing major and I want a different flavor on it, rather than knowing, okay, you know, the 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 general major sounds the the happy sound and minor the sad more somber type of thing that's real general and broad and that's that's good to get started but now knowing that okay if i alter the tetra chords and do it in a way you know i can come up with something that becomes you know a, a form that i only heard about but didn't know how it applied say lydian dominant something as simple as that that gets used a lot now these days it was very rare before you know because you think about a lydian scale um, just being the, the fourth mode of any regular major scale, but then suddenly you can do an alteration on that and make it a dominant. So you got Lydian dominant now, whole nother function, you know. So anyway, we're getting, getting a little, little off in there, but it's, it's like these things I, I just want to say is they help me as far as learning to understand and appreciate and be able to expand music more, you know. It's just like when we, us as audio engineers, when we want to do more with our plugins or more with arriving at a sound, that's why I tell everybody, understand the basis of what it's built on so that way you don't have to just go out and buy the newest thing. If you understand it, you can actually build it from basics. So if somebody, if your system shuts down and you gotta go bare bones, but you still gotta get a job done, you can still get it done because you understand how it was built on. It's really not that complicated. You know, a lot of people are sunk if it can't do any work if they lose their mate, their favorite thing, you know, that they've gotten used to, you know. And it's like, well, yeah, it's uncomfortable. You know, I, I swear, anytime I'm thrown into a situation where I can't use what I'm used to using, I hate it, you know, because you build your own toolbox and it's personalized for you. But if you walk into a situation and, um, you're forced to use what's there and make it work and all that. You got to have the foundation of knowing, well, for what I'm trying to do, I'm trying to build. How can I build it out, you know, with what I have at hand as opposed to what I'm normally used to that makes my job easier. You know. Anyway, anybody else got any final things to say? And I guess we'll wrap it up for today. But well, all I gotta say is like. Like you said, as far as like scales and stuff, it helps you better with keys. Like today, early, I found out that um, just by playing, like I said, playing along with different records, that Isaac Hayes' Hung Up On Me Baby and B.B. King's The Thrill Is Gone is in the same key. Yeah, yeah. Isn't that interesting? Like, yeah. I, like I was just playing it early, like before I got on the phone with you, and I'm just like, wait a minute. If I just play this note, I'm playing Hung Up On Me Baby, but if I just play this, I'm playing Thrill Is Gone. Let me tell you something that's real interesting to me, too. It's another thing. Um, I got into an argument with somebody about this, but they didn't realize it. Does, it. does anybody know who Steely Dan is, the group called Steely Dan? Yeah. I mean, I know the older guys definitely do. But yeah, definitely. Even you younger guys, you know, you should. This is a legendary group. Steely Dan um, um, is, is so funny because I didn't think about it. I had a, um, um, a keyboard course when I was trying to deal with it uh, and, um Donald Fagan had a keyboard course. And I didn't even realize this until he said it, and then I went back and looked at it. And a lot of Steely Dan stuff is basically the blues. It's a 12-bar blues. Now, he expanded, and he explained it to me. He's like, like Peg and stuff like that. You know, you, you know, if you know the song Peg, um, and if you don't, go look it up and listen to it. Listen, just strip away all the uh, all the sound of it and, and the fanciness is there, and, and just look at the form of it. It's really a 12-bar blues, you know. I seen your picture, 
and then human lights above it, and then it goes to the other thing, and then back down. So it goes four, four. You know, it's a twelve bar blues. It's really a twelve bar four. But they, you know, they do all the expansion. Other than the, um, you know, when they do the little parts in between, you know, that started out. But the basic part of the song where the verses are going and everything. Um, he said that. He said basically, I built that off of a twelve bar blues, and I just, you know, freaked it a bit. Real simple, you know, complicated stuff is usually always built off of the idea of something real simple. And, and yeah. the crazy part about that, too, is, like, I'm a big fan of Rage Against the Machine. Yeah. And like, yeah. majority of they songs, the the guitar player and bass player played the same rhythm, the same everything, just in different octaves. And every song is exactly like that, just in different keys. <laughs> Isn't that but, amazing? Yeah. And it's just a couple blues riffs, but and they just rap over it, would do whatever over it, but it just it just fits. It's like once you find your niche, it's like some people don't wanna some artists actually wanna expand their boundaries and go to do different things, what they sound like I'd say what, Jimi Hendrix or Radiohead or somebody that just wants to push the limits and some people once they find their niche, they just wanna stay there in that pocket. And that's okay too. That's good. I mean, it worked for BB King. <laughs> Definitely. Well, the, there's, there's there's a lot of bands that kind of that kind of stick to that, you know, same kind of thing all the time. Mm-hmm. You know, Rage is a great example of that. You know, I mean, yeah. it, with Rage, it was more the interplay between everybody. You know, granted, the bass and the guitar are pretty much doing the same thing ninety five percent of the time, but just the way they work, they didn't. Best way to put it is the guitar kind of wasn't really played like a traditional guitar was played. You know, I mean, yeah, he added all the effect stuff that he did, but he he used the guitar more more. I guess like what we were saying earlier with James Brown, like a drum. I was just gonna say that, yeah, yeah. like a drum. You know, yeah, that pocket and that rhythm was the whole thing about that band. You know, you can feel anybody and everybody's thing. If they remember and get to that, you know. Yeah, you Tom Morello. Like it was a like it was a damn sampler. Like yeah, he was he was crazy with that. Like yeah, he was he was scratching on it like as if it was a turntable. When I heard yeah. first, when I was in fifth grade and I first heard Bulls on Parade, I I lost it. Everybody was looking at me like this kid is weird because it was like everybody was listening to it, but I was listening to it like, did you not just hear what this man did? It's, but, it's, it was kind of like, for me, it was kind of like, wow, they really took this whole, because everybody back then was talking about, you know, rap metal. You know, that was the big thing. You know, bands like Korn and Limp Bizkit, and then Rage Against the Machine came on the machine uh, came on the scene, and it was just like, well, yeah, okay, we got Zach rapping. We got the drummer just laying down a groove. You got the bass player laying down a groove. The guitar parts are basically just clones of the of the of what's going on with the bass, just holding the pocket. And then, you know, like you said, Bulls on Parade with that whole scratch thing. I was just like, holy shit. Such a simple, basic thing from a guitar player standpoint. You know, just scrape on your strings. You know, it, <laughs> it, those influences and the things that they brought into the world of rock music was huge. You yeah. know, especially for me as, as a musician, I started looking at the guitar in a whole different way when it came to stuff like that. It's like, well, m- guitar maybe just doesn't have to carry a riff all the time. Maybe it could just be like cool and textural like that. And you know, it was it. They were definitely one of my favorite bands of all time. Just amazing, yeah, amazing band. And I would say the same about uh, Deftones because, like, I I used to grow up playing like White Pony. Like, I'm telling you now, White when White Pony came out. I didn't listen to no other album. I was in eighth grade. I'll never forget it. I listened what? to that album every day for an entire year. I didn't listen to nothing else, no radio, no nothing. But anyways, they chord progressions, and I didn't even know at the time, like I said, I played along. I didn't know, like, I lived across the street from a library, so I used to go get Guitar Mag, and I used to rip the guitar tab at the magazine. Whenever they got a new issue, and I go home and practice, I didn't know you could even do drop D or drop C. Like I learned System of a Down's Chop Suey, and that was a drop C tune. And I'm looking like, why the hell would you drop all the way down like this? But a lot of Limp Biscuit, Corn, Slipknot, all that stuff was like in drop C. And I'm looking like, why would you drop down so low? But I had to realize it just comes with the genre of music. Like each genre has their own little niche. Like the funk wouldn't be funk without a walk pedal or a chorus pedal or fuzz and hip-hop wouldn't be hip-hop without some programming or some drum breaks it's just 
like you said, Khalid, the more you learn, the more it's easier. And what Jason said, it's more it's easier to move o- around in different genres of music. Like with me coming up with all this musical influence, I can I can have one, I can have a conversation with any and everybody about music, and two, I can get in the studio with any and everybody, and just off my my musicality. I can hold a conversation and keep the, the session going smoothly. Like if I'm in a, like I grew up on punk rock music, so if I'm in a session with a punk band, I'd be like, why don't you play the riff like, like what some Tim played on on this particular rancid song? And they'd be looking like, okay, now we got a, we got trust. I'm building trust with him because he knows his music. He's not here for a quick buck. He actually appreciates what's going on. Um, yeah, yeah. And that's the difference between a producer and engin- engineer. That is definitely the the major difference between a producer and an engineer, right there. Being able to being able to take and mold and form things to you know the what the band hears in their head, or giving them an idea of what you know you think things should sound like, and bouncing all those ideas of each other. That I think is definitely the biggest part of being a producer. You know, is just it's not so much make, making sure that everything's perfect and this and that. It's just it's being able to take everything that they're doing and make it do what it needs to do to, to be cohesive and make it a song and make it great. You know, it's it's just it's a totally different mindset and it it's something that I'm not sure that everybody because I, I know I can tell you right now when I started in this business. I was like, what the hell is a producer? <laughs> I don't know what the hell. You know, I mean, you got the guy running the board. Okay, he's running the tape machine. He's handling all that. And the producer's just kind of sitting there in his chair, not doing nothing. I mean, I was working with, you know, seasoned guys when I was interning. So, you know, there really wasn't a lot of, well, why don't you try this? And why don't you try that? And why don't you try this? And why don't you try that? You know, the bands that we were working with and the artists we were working with kind of had their sound developed and everybody kind of knew what they were going for. You know, the producer would speak up every once in a while and be, oh, why don't you try singing this like this? Or why don't you try this harmony or that harmony? But it wasn't until I really delved into the rock world when, uh, you know, in the early 2000s that I really saw, like, producers at work, you know, uh-huh. trying to trying to fit different things in and, all that crazy stuff, you know. I mean, I had seen, like, you know, the Metallica DVDs, uh, well, VHSs at the time, where they were working on the Black Album, you know, yeah. and, and you know, Hetfield standing in the studio with a microphone and he's cocking a shotgun. I mean, what is all this? <laughs> what is this? Like the Red Hot Chili Peppers, uh, yeah. the Monk one about when they made the, what is it, Blood Sugar Sex Magic? That was great. I mean, like, I intern like, right now, like I said, I just moved to Georgia last year from Nashville. And I've been interning at different studios, even though I don't know where this conversation is going, but I've been interning at different studios. And like, like I guess I have a background in everything, but working at, interning at a hip hop studio and interning at a rock studio, when I tell you the recording process is night and day. Night and day. Like when I went to SAE, I, when they was like, because we had an SSL, it, was, it came out of Whitney Houston's house. And we had a Neve and we had. The Doobie Brothers AMR console. So the whole time we were there, I was like, I'm not doing rap. I need nothing but bands. I don't care if it's bluegrass, if it if it's country, I don't care. Just so I can have enough practice. Because if I get a rapper, it's just gonna be straight vocals. It's not gonna be no instrumentation, no nothing. But I was just I, I was at a uh, I was interning for Ben Allen Studio here in Atlanta, and he it's like a private studio and bands come in. They don't record like singles. They actually they're booked up for a whole album, so they're there for at least two, three months. So I get to watch them when they're doing like drum overdubs. The drummer is going through different snares from different years, and I'm looking like y'all actually pay that much attention to detail to when it comes to your music versus a rapper don't even want to act, don't even ask you what sample is that or what kind of music you listen to. Like I'll be I was mixing a record for this uh, female rapper one time. And I was just trying to make conversation, and I was just like, "So, who are your uh, music influences?" Nobody. I'm I'm my influence. I'm looking like <laughs> what? <laughs> oh yeah. I said, "Who's your favorite female rapper?" I'm my famous female rapper. I said, "Oh my god, I'm doing the I'm in, I'm in the wrong business. I need some I need some other shit to do because this is crazy." Yeah, yeah, I hear you. 
Oh, I meant to tell you too. Uh, Mitchell said he had just changed out of his Deftone shirt. <laughs> oh yeah, yeah. I finally got to see them live. When I tell y'all, like, okay, I'm like I told you, like that James Brown movie. Me and him, we we have a lot in common because all I have is music. So if y'all don't understand, like, I'll talk about this twenty four seven. I don't know. I don't watch sports. I don't do nothing but music. But when I finally saw Deftones last year, I cried. Because that's how bad I wanted to see him. Because I never, I never thought I'd ever get a chance to see him. Because they bass player died. Because he was in a coma for years. Wow. And, yeah. But when I got to see him, it wasn't the, the original, all the original band, but I still got to see him. And I got to see the Smashing Pumpkins. And I got to see Outkast this year. So it's oh, like, yeah. Okay, yeah. So it's like my bucket list. And I've seen Al Green like four or five times. So my bucket yeah. list is, yeah. But... Yeah, I don't even know where I'm going because, like I said, I can talk about music all day. Uh, it's all good. Yeah, but definitely, like you were saying, you know, it's a totally different mentality between, like, you know, I mean, even doing, like, I mean, I had, I've had opportunity to work on, um, we did, a, well, I did a record years ago. It was this island drumming thing, and it was all, like, it was all really percussion and ukes and, and things like that, and it was so different than working on a rock record. You know, I mean, I had done the hip hop thing because that's really where I don't want to say this one, but my basis, my basis was rock music. But my first taste in the business was doing hip hop and R and B. Then I do this, you know. Then I did a couple rock records, and then I did a this island record, and it was just, it was so different. You know, I mean, we we worked, we did three tracks that were on that record, and it was just, I mean, that's the only way I can describe it is just completely different mentality. You know, the different drums and how we're going to mic them and how we're going to get everything set up. And there was like a a, a Polynesian, you know, a chorus of people, you know, and how we were going to mic all these 30 people that are in the room. And it, it's just all different techniques, all different aspects. And then from something like that to go back to like a rock record, it makes a rock record look easy, really <laughs> easy. <laughs> yeah, right. yeah, yeah, yeah. I know what you mean, man. It's cool. I love it that, you know, we have learned, and I hope we've, um, you know, made the point that expanding your boundaries definitely can never hurt, you know. Just learning the things that will take you to that next level or give you an incremental lift in trying to elevate your craft, no matter what it is. Once I started learning more about music, and I'm still learning now, and I'm actually relearning some of the stuff that I learned that I kind of glossed over because I told you guys I'm trying to get back to playing guitar again. You know, I suck right now, but trust me, I'll be all right. <laughs> Give me about six months, and, and and I'll be decent. Let me put it that way. I know I'll never be like I was, but because I have so much more musical understanding now, I know I'll be able to go to the parts more directly instead of just kind of fumbling along and doing something. Instead of overplaying and doing inappropriate things, I'll know why, because having learned from watching studio musicians and I, there was a time when I first started at the time when I could play really well. I was play really well, was very fast and do all that. That was the claim to fame. So my ego got to me a little bit where I thought, you know, I'm hearing all these records. I can do just as good as that guy. I'm seeing all the guys that are studio musicians, you know. Well, I can play just as good as them. And I didn't really get it and understand that it was what they weren't playing that was the art, you know. What they weren't playing and what they knew to play, you know, because they could play anything that I could play, but I couldn't necessarily play anything that they could play. That was a hard lesson to learn, and that's definitely something I needed to chop down that ego of thinking that, hey, just because these guys are making it look easy, what's well, supposed to look easy, they're virtuosos. You're not, <laughs> you know. So hey. I had to come to grips with that. <laughs> hey, I got a, I got a quick question because it's been on my mind, and I'm pretty sure y'all can answer it. Like I've been, like I just recently started taking a class, like the history of rock and roll. And, like, I'm at part one. It's, like, between the 1920s and 1950s. And I got to thinking, like, with these newer generations that's coming up, do you think that they're going to know the history of certain genres of music? The like, hip-hop, you know, people don't even care to look back into where it started because hip-hop is, like, the youngest genre. It just turned 41. But it's, like, do you think other people... I mean, I come across a lot of people that don't even care to know the history of the craft that they're even pursuing. Like, I just had to get into the 
Oh, where was I going with that? I was at Books of Million the other day, and like I said, I have a conversation with people about anything if it's regarding music. And a guy picked mm-hmm. up a guitar book. See, he he looked similar to, to Jason, which kind of funny. But we got to talking, and we started talking about different guitars and style bodies, and he started naming off stuff I never heard. So I'm playing along, like, yeah, yeah, yeah. But I had to go home and double back and start studying different. Style, like body styles of guitars, it's like, do you think that eventually is history going to die off to the point where no one knows about it, or you think they're going to actually make it important? I'm talking for the newer generations. I'm not talking about us. Like, no, no, people. no, 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 no. I, I get what you're saying, but see, here's the thing. Um, see, and there's smart people like yourself that, you know, you know what it is. And there's always going to be that handful of smart. See, the general crowd, that guy you were talking about that didn't want to even know what it's built on, he's part of the general crowd, you know. And I'm not trying to um, condemn or, or cut down anybody's thing and all that. But the smart ones out here, the guy, the people that end up being legends, trust me, they all know their history. They've all done. You can name anybody out here, you know. I'll tell you the person, that's, and I've, I've told this story before, but the person that really surprised me the most, was Will I Am when when I saw how deep his knowledge was from the stuff in the past. He knew more than people in the room that were definitely twice his age, you know, because he had done his homework. He knew about his history, so that's why he has so much success. I mean, massive success. All the smart ones, you know, know what things are built on, and they go back and study. The folks that are kind of in the general pool of it all, they don't care about it. They just want to get paid for now. They usually get, you know, if they're good and talented, they'll get some money for now. Those people that have lasting, long-lasting careers that want to be around for whatever, they always do it, you know. All these people that we can name, you know, I, I, I would defy anybody to name probably anybody. And then if we go research them, we will find out that they definitely knew a whole lot about stuff in the foundation in history back in, like you said, through early 1900s all the way up till now. They went way, way back and they know history of life. You know, it doesn't, and it doesn't have to be an extensive history. It just has to be a bit, I don't know, you know, I've done some studying, but I don't know everything about a lot of this stuff. But I did just like you did too, because I want to consider myself one of the smart ones too, because I want to be around. So I listen to music that was, you know, back there. Oh, I listened to all them old time shows because that was the popular music of their day. I study one of the things that when I'm in a messed up, not messed up frame of mind, but when I need my spirit to be calm and happy or whatever, I'll listen to, um, I love George Gershwin. I love Gershwin stuff. It just takes me somewhere else. So when I really want to go into another kind of frame of mind, I go back and listen to stuff like that. You know, I like all the guys, you know, the, the, um, Rogers and Hart stuff and um, uh, Jerome Kern and st- stuff like that for the guys back in the day where a lot of people won't even know some of these old folks, you know, go back in the day and uh, um, um, I can't, uh, I can't, I can't even pu- pull some of them, but I check them all out, you know, I love watching, just like I watched James Brown, you know, I go back and watch all those old um, um, uh, bio uh, pics that come out from these old folks that they were the stars back in their day, you know. Um, uh, you learn from that stuff and you you appreciate song crafting, for example, songwriting. If you really want, want to learn about songwriting and how to craft a song, you've got to study some of those old masters back in the day, you know, because a, a lot of those times when those people were back in the day and a lot of those people came from the Brill building up in New York, and they had to compete and do stuff like that, and it was a, as a factor and everything. You really had to know how to craft something and build it on a foundation. Back in the day when they were doing plays and the plays, there wasn't no record sales and everything. They were selling sheet music and sending people to see plays and stuff like that. That was, you know, that was the iTunes of it that day. You know, you got to understand what that is and understand how we got here now and everything if you don't understand you'll make some money now you know if you do anything and got some talent you'll make money now that's not a problem if you want to be around you got to study so yeah to answer your question i gotta know i got a long way to gavin but to answer your question i'm so passionate about that because i really think that's a must if you want to have longevity you got to study the history foundation 
Because I was, I was, like I said, I went to a producer showcase and I was talking to a, a handful of producers and I was like, I just got this folder of drum samples. Like, I don't know who did it, but they went around and recorded every vintage drum machine. Like, got all the drum samples out of it and made a big folder. When I say it's like a laundry list of every drum kit and they had the Lynn drums in it and I was telling them, they was like, what's the Lynn drums? And I'm like, in the back of my mind, I'm like, do you listen to Prince? Like, I mean, where I'm from, like I said, I was raised by my grandparents. So most people, when they grew up, they wanted to be Michael Jordan. They wanted to be this. I wanted to be Johnny Taylor. So, uh, yeah, right. Al Green, you know what I'm saying? Al Green, like where I'm from, Al Green is like 45 minutes away where he's from. And Conway Twitty is from where I'm from. Mm -hmm. And like Robert Johnson, where he supposedly sold his soul is 10 minutes away from where I'm from. Like I could take you to where he supposedly sold his soul. Yeah, he married right. a woman from where I'm from, and he taught a couple people there how to play guitar. So, all of that is just like coming from the Delta and moving out and living in different places. Like it's completely different. Like, yeah. And when you talk to people about music, some people say they love music, but when you get in an in-depth conversation like we having, you find out they really don't like it as much as as they think they do. And like you, you brought up Will I Am. I've been went reading Quest Love's book that he came out with. Yeah, he's another one. Yeah. When I tell you, he he's really making me want to go and become a musicology major because that yeah. man, like, yeah, man, yeah, yeah, yeah he's yeah, another one, definitely. Yeah, he, he he's ridiculous with it. But the funny thing is, like I said, you really can tell. You know, you can tell the ones who did it. You know, and this is why they become icons and legends. You Pharrell know? too. Pharrell, one of them too. Absolutely, absolutely. You can tell. I mean, it's so obvious, man. You know. Um, I, you know, I, I, um, and a lot of people want to, uh, want to put him down. I don't know why. I think he's one of the talented cats out there too. Same thing with Justin Timberlake. Justin. Timberlake. Oh yes, yes. I yes. mean, he's one of the most talented cats out there because he studied. He's done his homework. Always does his homework and did it. Because it's, it's people on the outside looking in that's quick to judge. Like, like, like you say, you play guitar. I play guitar. I can play. Perfect example. I played. Thrill is gone today. I filmed it a little fifteen minute sec second of it, put it on Facebook or something. Everybody's like, "Oh my gosh, you so good!" It's like, no, I'm not. I'm decent. I know people that have cut my head off in a heartbeat. It's just you on the outside looking in, you don't understand like how many days these people put in, like how many hours, how many, how much self discipline you gotta have to. Cause I I had to really sit back and think when I used to play viola. And when I used to play in orchestra, I didn't have no life. I didn't have no, I went into girls, I went into sports, went to school, came home, looked at four walls every day until I got my instrument down. Yeah, yeah. But it's like nowadays, this new generation, I mean, certain places people get it because, I mean, it's still going on. But I feel like as the generations go on, it's less and less. Yeah. Because, yeah, like, when I was with distractions, too, because coming up with us, you know, that was our distraction other than getting out, like you said, and playing sports or some other stuff. You know, I'm just like you, man. I mean, I locked myself in. I was in the shed. So when I when I came out the shed, I was a beast. But I was in the shed hours and hours and hours on end all day long. Guitar in my hand. TV on. I'm playing all the TV commercials and everything. TV shows on. I'm, I'm learning the, the, the music behind the shows and everything. Um falling asleep and I'm boy put that guitar down you know I'm yeah. going to sleep and I just got the guitar in my I mean you know that's how it is you you got to do it like that man right. you know that's how I taught myself ukulele man was yeah. playing playing really quiet to the TV while my wife and I were watching TV <laughs> <laughs> yeah but, yeah um, no shit it, it's something else well guys this has been a great yeah, discussion but we, let's, let's, let's end it now everybody's dropping off like flies so I know mm -hmm. we've been going a while but I get passionate about it and I know everybody else can feel yeah. the passion too so anyway we'll get back on and we'll continue from another point of view because it's a big thing keep stacking on your education keep getting better and better mm -hmm. study history Fill in what you don't know. Um, if you need to get your business tighter, find out what it is. We're going to give you some more resources, too. And I'm putting together some things. I'm leading up to doing the Music Mixing Success Boot Camp. That's going to be another one of the aspects that I cover to make it a little bit different, a little more helpful. So be on the lookout for us, guys, and I will mm -hmm. catch everybody later on. Okay, have a great day.
Check it All right, out. take it easy, man. All right, y'all. Good. Later, guys. Later. Gavin. What's up? We're going to stay, uh, we're going to be off the air, but we're going to stay on for a little bit after so we can try to get you, uh, your interface hooked in to, uh, so you can play your music in stereo. Cool. cool. All right, cool. Can we do that? Is that okay? Uh, go, yeah, Philippe? go ahead, guys. When you guys can stay on there, and it'll stay Yeah, out. I'm finna, um, Bill told me to download Soundflower, so I'm going to download Soundflower, and he said that. Yeah, uh, Gavin, we'll get okay. you in on the next one then. So you can play okay. some stuff, okay? I, okay, I'm going to end the broadcast, guys. I'll catch you all later. All right, bye-bye.